Hello and welcome back to All You Need. And in this case, all you need to make HTML5 games, and we're going to make a tile game. I'm Dr. Abstract. Let's go see the game now. It is called Eternal Orbs. Ooh. Speaking of ooh, ooh seems to be leading in this leaderboard. So Zim Game Module has a leaderboard, and here she be. And uh, we hit play. Ooh, we have to figure out which orbs are eternal. That was, oh, yes, as in not changing. And there's another one right underneath it. <laughs> Sometimes that's the hardest. So those are the two we've captured, and then the level goes up. You see one? Mm, let's see. Ah, You're probably going, oh, the one in the corner. The one, oh, no, the one in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> switched on me. Uh, there should be one more. So each level you have to find one more. Um, aren't they nice orbs? There we go. These were made with Mid Journey. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. And so another level, etc. So there's five levels. Uh, and each time we have to find one more. And there's more orbs available. There's a timer. And in the end, oh, a mute button too. Ooh, and a fade out of the sound, and then a fade in if we take it back up. Isn't that nice? Uh, so once we're done, it would take our time and put it on the leaderboard. Okay, uh, we're following a tutorial. This is the fourth in a series of tutorials available on the medium here. And... This one is called a tile game tutorial. So the others were an isometric board game. And we'll link to these down at the very bottom of the tutorial. Isometric board game, a side scroller, and a falling game. So you should check those out as well. There's what we're making. Okay, and in preparation, there is your guide. Oh, this is the edited version. I don't want to be in the edited version. So I'll share a draft link, and copy that, and put it up here, like so. Maybe I'll do a swap of these, just in case we find something we want to change. That's a draft version, and you never know, there might be something we want to change, and I can just whip on over to that one and edit it. Okay, so coming down in preparation there. Now I can click that, your guide to coding creativity on the canvas. And this is an overview of what it's like to code on the canvas, new circle.center.drag. We've made these tutorials for everyone. Some of you may be coming in already using Zim or already using JavaScript or not using anything. And so if you haven't done anything before, this is where you would come. You would try things out, the basics, etc. And then we break it down for those of you who are a bit more advanced or even learning, we break it down into a whole bunch of mini guides. So which framework you should use, the, the template, how do you get started, what are display objects, what are the components, what are these conveniences that we talk about when we use Zim, interactivity, how do we interact with things, animation, accessibility, assets, style, responsive and adaptive, and the controls, things like motion controllers, parallax emitters, etc. All right, and this article has a bunch of summaries as well of each of those things. So that's great. Come on over to that one and check it out if you so desire. All this is free with very little setup as well. We have a, an editor, a Zim editor, and in that we have both the games. This is the simple tile game right here. If we press that. It goes to what's called a zap page or a promo page for the zap. Uh, we call our Zim apps zaps. Cool, huh? And you can press on that or there's different ways in. But anyway, we'll just press on that. That basically shows the game right there in the editor. And you can see the code for that game if you want. There's not much there. That's it right there for the tile game. And you can copy that code over into the right-hand side. Uh, this one you have to <clears throat> figure out excuse me you have to figure out which one of these things are not changing oh and if you get it wrong it dips down and it keeps track of rights and wrongs it basically just keeps going there's no real levels exactly on that one 
Because this is such a simple game, it really is a pretty simple game. We're just making a tile. So there's the tile right there of our colors. We're choosing one of those to be the one that doesn't change. And as we, we probably are doing an interval here, and we're basically saying uh, if it's not the one that we don't want to change, <laughs> if it's the one we're not changing, basically, then change the color. Otherwise, it's going to end up staying the same. So that's a sort of the logic in there. When we mouse down, we figure out if we got the right one. If we got the right one, we show a nice reward emitter. And otherwise, we're going to animate all the tiles down or do something bad and change the wrong score. And there's the score. Okay, because this example isn't really all that difficult, we've really gone all out to make it a complete example. As a matter of fact, I have the complete example over here, so I'm going to hit test. The complete example has the leaderboard. The complete example has nice um, images from a sprite sheet. It's got a custom font up top. We have some controls down at the bottom with a mute, and we've got different levels. So all those things, the levels, the leaderboard, the, the sounds working, all that adds to the code. And this is the most complete game of uh, this tutorial. And there's the emitter, the cool extra emitter effects. The fact that once we, uh, once we solve this level, we show a reward sort of in, in between. Uh, we didn't do that initially. These are all things that we added to really try and finish off this game. All right, so it's going to be a bit of a long tutorial. <laughs> uh, I think it's almost double in terms of writing uh, of some of the others. So bear with us and we'll learn as we go. That's another thing that happened in this tutorial. As we scroll down here, you'll see we have a few, uh, a few examples of working with tiles. So we're going to talk about how we can work with tiles so that you can make different types of tile games as well. So exploring a tile, that's in here as well. And you're always welcome to view this in parts. It's probably going to be a couple hours, I would imagine. Uh, think of it as a lesson. Remember going to school? Yeah, I actually teach three-hour lessons, so it's, it's not all that much for me. <laughs> it's just a lesson. <laughs> there you go. Um, so you're welcome to take a break, though, and get a cookie. <laughs> not yet. We're just getting started. You can still hang out here while we're starting. That's great. So the next thing that comes in the tutorial here is talking about the template. We could work in, in the editor itself, uh, but we're going to work in VS Code. So there's a link to VS Code, and we're going to go and copy the Zim template and bring it into VS Code. The two things, the editor and VS Code, are very similar, and we talk about the differences right here and so forth. But let, let's go ahead and do it then. Let's go out to Zim. So here's the Zim site at zimjs.com, and I'm going to press on Code and then hit copy. So that copies our template. And then we'll move this on over into VS Code. Is right here, I have a file called tile, tile.html. This is all in an HTML page. And we will call this one Eternal Orbs. Uh, there we go. And uh, let's see, if you don't know how to make a file, you could go open up your VS Code and say new file. Usually we find a folder. I happen to be in a folder called Tutorials. So you could uh, get a folder over here in the File Explorer. That's, that's this one right here, and you have to add a folder. It's a little bit tricky to start, but it becomes pretty easy once you get used to it. And then I right click and say new file, and you want to call it tile.html, okay? So there we are, and you can go over that in the tutorial text if, you, if I did that too quickly for you. So we're going to import Zim, and one of the things it says is we've got to add the game module there, maybe the pizzazz module, so we have to do some adjustments here. We're going to do some adjustments in here as well. But the first thing to look at is basically in here, this is where you put your code. And so we have a new circle. If I right click and look at this, open in default browser, I see that I have a circle like that. You uh, might be going, oh, no, 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 I don't have a right click open in default browser. Help, help, help. 
Uh, yeah, that's because there's extensions over here and we have installed the open in browser extension. So you want to do a search for open in browser there and hit the install. It just takes a moment to install that. We also have live server installed. These are two ways that you can view. I could open with live server or open default browser. And that just allows you to view your HTML page in a browser nice and easily like that. Okay, so this is called the fit mode that we're in. Here's the stage. This gray part is the stage that Zim provides. That's left over from Flash, which is left over from Director. Uh, we, we had stages. So that's the stage. We're fitting that into the window, except we've got kind of the wrong dimension that we're wanting. We want a tall, skinny one. Remember this, this one right here, tall and skinny. And if you're in the editor, we get that by hitting the portrait and then the phone. And indeed, uh, where it says put your code here, that's what's in the editor. The put, put your code here is in the editor. The template's built into the editor up top and at the bottom. So in the editor, we adjust things here. Uh, and, but in our code in VS Code, we can adjust them right in the code. So basically, the editor has this built in, and then that's at the bottom and all you're putting in the editor is that code right there. We're given the frame, the stage, the width and the height. These are little variables with capital letters that uh, match those things. It's handy for us. Okay, so if we take out this, which we don't need, and save it, then I can come back here and refresh our eternal orbs, and I no longer have um, the circle there. And if we take a look at the tutorial here. Uh, this is explaining it all. Delete the circle, center and drag the code as we do. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. I was going to just pop on over here. I saw something. HTML5 games. Beep, 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 beep. We have been, most of the time when we give commands, we are uppercasing, or no, bolding them there. And I just realized that we said to delete the circle center and drag code. That would be nice if it were bold. So apologies. Some quick editing there. All right. Um, the gray box is a stage. We mentioned that. We mentioned the template versus the editor. And now we're into the making of the game. So yeah, here's some code that we want to change. We're going to import. Well, let's bring this in. And we're changing both these things here. So copy that right down to the new frame. There's the new frame, and there's the import, and let's see what we did. <clears throat> okay, so it was just Zim like that, and we've added the game module. The game module has extra things like the leaderboard that we want and the timer. It's got an isometric board back when we did the isometric board example, etc. And then here is Pizzazz. Pizzazz gives us icons, backings, and patterns. Uh, there are three different pizzazzes, but this brings them all in. And so we can make icons and choose different types of icons. So we'll see that. We brought them in as Zim and Zim2. These We don't really use the namespaces. We can set it up so that we can. If you're a professional programmer and really used to namespaces, uh, that can be done if we really want. But um, We've made it global. That makes it easier for kids and stuff. We don't have to say new zim.frame and blah, blah, blah. All right. Uh, and what did we change here? We changed the dimensions. 720 by 1280. Now it will be more. Uh, this is the width and that's the height. We've also made the background black. These are zim colors. You can also use mm, here's OK. Here's an HTML color, for instance, red. That's an HTML red color. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, my goodness. So it is black, and there's the dimensions we wanted. And then, ah, that's the HTML red color in the background. Here's the Zim red color. So any color that doesn't have quotes is the Zim version, and it's more of a muted kind of tomato. There's actually an HTML color tomato. You want to see that? Tomato. And let's see how close it is to our Zim color. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, it's a little oranger. Tomato's a little oranger. And bring that back to, well, we don't want red. 
We'll call it darker. Darker, dark. And what we've got now. Okay, there's where we're going to be coding. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, ooh, well, come back here and check out the next step. Hmm. And there's how to do it in the editor. And in the editor, we don't have access to the frame color, so we would do it with F for the frame dot color equals black, and that allows us to set it even after the frame's made. So we're going to explore a tile now. Here's a tile. We'll grab this code. A tile is really a convenience, although we call it a control because we're operating on things that exist. That's generally how we... So if we have a motion controller, it operates on something that already exists. If we have a pen, we're actually drawing with pattern or with um, objects that already exist. A Zim pen's a little bit different than most pens. It's pretty cool. And uh, parallax operates on things, etc. So those are controls. Uh, the tile, um, it does operate on existing. So here are things, and it's going to end up tiling them, put them in order. We can also, we've also got a wrapper that's kind of similar where it will tile it but wrap things. And uh, that's also under controls as well. So here we have a new tile. We're going to tile a circle right here. And we're going to have six of them. So this is the information or the parameter names. We have six of them, six columns, uh, 10 rows, and spacing H of 10 and spacing V of 10. And there's a lot more parameters as well for a tile. We've done something a little bit unusual. Let's just start off with, rather than the array being passed in there, let's make it pink. And we're centering that tile on the stage. By default, that is the stage, although we can center it on other containers as well. Same with pose. The way we put things on the stage is center. We'll center it, center reg centers it and centers what's called the registration point. Uh, pose positions it around the edges or from the center and loc locates the registration point. Then there's just add to, which we'll just add it or whatever X and Y happens to be added, we'll add it. So those are the ways that we would add to the stage. And all of those have a container that they want to add to as a parameter and the layer in the container if we want. Let's see it. So we save that up and right click here. Oh, well, open a default browser, but I think I've already got one open. You may as well just keep this one open and just pop on over and take a look at it. Ooh, so there's a bunch of pink circles tiled. That's a tile. However, if we wanted to tile different colors, we can put these in square brackets and write the different ones. Let's just go back to whatever we had there pink, blue, and yellow. So that's in square brackets as an array. And what Zim will do is it will pick from any of those colors. This is called a Zim V value because it was the system was invented in Zim V version five of Zim. And there we go, we got random colors. If we wrote, uh, refresh again, different random colors. And that's one type of Zim V value. What if we wanted a series though? So let's make a series. Series is another type of Zim V value. And well, now it will pick these in order. So the first time it'll be pink, then blue, then yellow, then pink, then blue, then yellow, then pink, then blue, then yellow. And the series has all sorts of uh, different ways that it can work. It go pink, blue, yellow, and then yellow, blue, pink. So it could sort of flip or reverse. It can also go pink, blue, yellow, pink, uh, let's see, pink, blue, yellow, blue, pink. So not repeat the yellow, that could be done. It could um, randomize each time it goes. It could randomize each time it goes and not repeat the last one that it had. So that's, that's mix and shuffle, I think. Um, it can bounce, you can skip numbers. Uh, so it is very powerful, the series. And that's a series. You can also do things like a min and a max value. So a min of 20 and a max of 50. And we could tile based on that. And when we refresh, we get that. And note that they're all top left aligned though. So you'd want to probably center align those to make it look a little bit better. Isn't that cool? So that, that's another Zim V value. Uh, these are called dynamic parameters. And, or we call them <laughs> Zim V values, but they are dynamic parameters. 
It's a Zim invention. It makes Zim very powerful. If we're emitting things, we can emit things with different colors. We could actually pass in an array of different objects and emit those. Um, if we're making a time uh, or an interval, we could emit, we could do the interval with the min and a max time so that each time it picks from within that, or we could do the interval with a series and play notes in time. So it's very powerful. That we call a convenience in Zim. All right. Um, what else about this? How do we know which one we pressed on? Or that's a good question. Um, or maybe how could we drag any of these? Let's go back to what was that? Was it 50? 30? I can't remember. It was 50. And we don't want the series. All right. So we're back to how we had it. If we put a dot drag on there, note where I went. I went just before the semicolon dot drag like that. This is called chaining and in Zim we chain most things and that means that the center will return the tile and therefore the drag is on the tile and the drag since it returns a tile too that will end up being put in pods properly because we might want to reference this tile afterwards. So that's chaining. Um, your environment needs to be set up to be able to do that or all your methods or your classes have to be set up to do that. And in Zim we did. Uh, okay, so now I can drag any of these that I press on. Isn't that neat? So we just put a drag on the whole container and I can get those. Note that as I'm dragging, this blue that I picked up comes up on top. Now if I pick up the pink, it comes up on top. Pick up the blue, it comes up on top. You may or may not want that as you drag. So drag has some parameters. The first parameter of drag is the boundary. And so if we pass in the stage, now when we pick this up, it will only drag in the stage. We can't drag it outside the stage. It won't, <laughs> it won't go. The other ones that we want, that we were talking about, is on top. And so we can set on top colon false. Uh, but on top is another parameter. It's after some other parameters where we can throw things about and we can go on. Actually, do you want to see those? We can, um, well, because we don't quite know the order, unless we look at the docs, we're welcome to look at the docs. You want to see that? Uh, Zim, that's the editor. Oh, actually, the docs are in the editor, but well, I'll show you. Show them here back in Zim. Here are the docs. And if I type in drag like that, uh, there are the parameters for the drag and we want on top. Where's that on top? And I was thinking of showing you the surround thing. That's kind of neat. And there's another one where it's got all. Where's all? Actually, maybe I'll show you the surround one once we get the um, once we get the our orbs in. It will be more impressive at that point. So let's just go to the on top. But what I was saying is we'd have to pass in undefined, 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 and undefined, and then get to the top. That's kind of annoying. In Zim, we can also use null, 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 null. It's a little bit better, but still kind of annoying. So in Zim Duo, that's version two of Zim, we created the Zim Duo technique. And that means we can go to a single parameter that is an object literal. A configuration object we often call it right there so now we can go directly there and say on top colon true and okay and when we save that that goes to the on top and let's have a look back here Whoop. so we refresh here now when i pick up the yellow uh hmm. oh <laughs> okay <laughs> on top colon false it's already by default on top colon true so now <laughs> <laughs> when I pick up this pink, it's going underneath these these other ones. Okay, it's not it's it's on top of these ones because those ones are made first, and then so basically how it goes: this one is at the bottom, and then this one's up on top of that, and this one's on top of that. But these ones, see now it doesn't go on top. Okay, Zim Duo technique, and we'll use that throughout. If you wanted to drag them all then you would say all colon true and that drags all of the things here so if we refresh here we can now drag it all all right um how does 
how do events happen on on this? This is kind of an event. When we mouse down, we're picking up one and moving it. And on press move, we move it. And on press up, we, we drop it. So drag is filled with events inside. Um, and if we want to make our own event, for instance, we could tap. So this is one way and call an arrow function to tap uh, in there. But uh, all of our events can be, uh, the tap is kind of a chainable convenience one. It's like a click. If you want other events, you use the on method, pods.on, mouse down, for instance, like that, call this arrow function. We do not chain the on method. If we chain the on method, the on method returns a, an ID so that we can turn the event off. And therefore, it doesn't chain. So if we were to chain that like so, it might work the very first time, but uh, pods would no longer be the tile. It would be an ID so that we could turn this event off and then we'd be in trouble. Okay, so don't chain the on method. Most other methods though, are chainable, um, but not the on method. Um, all right, so we can then use the event object right here. This is the event object. We call it E, and if we only have one thing, we can do that with the arrow function. And we can do E.target.dispose, uh, for instance. <laughs> Despise. Oh, <laughs> one of those things is uh, an O. Okay, there we go. And if we make a change after, like we press down on this, if we make a chain, a change, we have to um, update the stage. Stage dot update. Unless we're already updating the stage in an animation, or often when we have physics or three JS or three stuff, it's already updating. But if Nothing else is going on. We don't update the stage. Do you want to see it? So there, I save that. It's pods.onMouse down, and I'm expecting it to be disposed or removed from. And look, it didn't go. I pressed on two or three there. Watch what happens though when I resize. They're gone. So press, 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 resize, gone. When we resize, we update the stage. So basically, that'll tell you, yeah, we forgot to update the stage. Um, and that's to conserve batteries. That's better than what Flash did. Flash updated the stage all the time, and we don't. Um, actually, 3JS updates the stage all the time, but that's because it figures you're in 3D and you're moving all the time. Uh, and when we're making general interactive media, that's not always the case. Uh, we're waiting for somebody to press in a button or whatever. We don't need to constantly be updating the stage. So CreateJS, which is what Zim built on, is built on, um, makes it so that we have to update the stage there. And there we go. The other thing we might want is, if we're mouse downing on this, is to be able to see that we want to press on that. So this needs a cursor. We call it .cur. And so we're chaining on a .cur. We can choose different types of HTML cursors in there, or HTML, uh, CSS cursors in there. So we save that and refresh, and there we have, by default, a pointer finger. Now we know that we can press on these things. Okay. So there we go. That's a little bit about a tile. We can find out which one. We could set the color of it instead of e.target.dispose. We could say color. Can't get that O today. Equals red. And now every one that we press on will be red. How would you make it so that only the blue ones go red? I'll try. I put in a conditional. Uh, like I said, we're doing a little bit of explore here so that you can make different types of tile games rather than just the one that we're making here. But we're about to go on and uh, carry on with our tutorial. So if um, e.target.color double equals blue. So if it's blue, then we're going to set the color to red. And we come back here, refresh. I'm pressing on some pink ones. Oh, the blue ones change, but yellow ones don't. Blue ones do. Yellow and pink do not. Okay. We can imagine uh, some sort of game being made from that. We'll show you some other tile games as well that we've made down at the bottom. We've made a bunch of them. Anyway, let's go back to our uh, steps then. That was exploring. There might be a few other things in here. 
uh, that we didn't do, although it looks like roughly we followed it. We could change the colors in interval. Okay, so we didn't do that. Uh, this, this was changing the colors in an interval. And uh, you're welcome to take a look at how, how to do that. Pods. Our tile is a bunch of plasma pods. Oh, right. So what we have is a picture that will, uh, that will hold all of these plasma pods, a hundred of them, 10 by 10 grid. And we got that from Mid Journey. We haven't even really seen it. Is there a picture of it? Okay, yeah, here they are. So these are the plasma pods. And what we did in Mid Journey, which is a, uh, AI to make pictures, is we prompted, imagine a grid of plasma pod icons against a black background, a grid. So a grid gives us lots and plasma pod icons makes them nice and tidy as a single thing. And we did that. We have a robots game and we asked for a, a grid of robot icons. And it, it, that's amazing. Yay! Okay, so there's a very good tip for you when you're... Otherwise, if you did each one, you'd have to worry about getting it in the same style as the last one. Um, and But doing them in a grid like that. And plus, it's pretty big. So we're, you know, it's... it's you know what I mean? We're getting a fairly large picture there. It's a large grid, so it works out just fine. So coming on down here, we're going to load in our assets. And there's, uh, looks like this is all of our code. Okay, let's grab all that. And we're going to go in and replace. Uh, just beware if you're using the editor. So this is right from the new frame on down. To the end of ready paste and uh, looks like we don't need that so what did we do we're preparing our assets uh, and if you're in the editor this will be a little bit different but we'll talk about that in a sec so we're preparing our assets the zim editor that is i guess this is an editor too <laughs> uh, we're preparing our assets this is the file that we want to load and here's the path that it's coming from zimjs.org actually would be better org um, and although the com works but we want our assets in org so my apologies i knew there was something i wanted to change and that be it so where was that put doop 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 org orgy that's a tricky one huh um all right hopefully that'll be the last of the updates there and org has this thing called cores or cross origin resource set up it's got an xml file there allowing people to use our assets the com not necessarily although it seems to work fine maybe it's because it's in the same directory i think we're good anyway org is uh, what we got, want you guys to use we've got about mm, 700 assets there do you want to see them just quickly and we'll want that that's the draft uh, this is the game. Well, whatever it doesn't. Yeah, that's the game. We may as well keep that one. I'll come out here. Okay, zimjs.com slash assets like that. Assets. And here they all are. But how you probably would get to them is press on this right here and then zoom in. And there, oh, there's what they're all called. So there's a bunch of asteroids that you can use if you want. Sounds are in there as well. This was made for Zim Kids. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> Ice cream cones! <laughs> but uh, you never know. Sometimes there's different backings as well. You never know. You might want uh, a few viruses uh, <laughs> or something like that for your game. All right, so we're just throwing various assets in there as well as we go along, including one for our orbs. Mm. All right. Um... We then, that just sets them up there like that as variables, but then we're going to pass them into the frame after the ready. So there they are, assets and path. We have the ready function. The ready function will be called when these have been loaded. This is called preloading. <clears throat> and then we're going to use one, new pick plasma pods. It's tabbed in. New pick plasma pods is the name of the pick right there. You see how that matches? And then we're centering it and dragging it. Let's have a look. There they are. And there's our dragging. I mentioned dragging. Uh, we have a glide. Or is it slide? Slide, I think. 
so that we can throw this right now we can't uh, let's try it and we can also you see how that's bigger than the stage this is the stage we can make it kind of snap so that it stays surrounding the stage and that's how you would do a sliding site so let's take a peek at how you would do that with our drag we'll go to the zim duo technique and it's slide pull and true like that and surround uh, surround colon true okay uh, let's see what that looks like <clears throat> oh uh, that didn't quite work surround oh uh, we have to set bounds so if we want surround true we set the bounds boundary colon the stage what are our bounds that we're going surrounding? There we are. Okay. So now you see how I've gone from one corner to the other, and that's a slide snap. You don't have to have that. You can turn that off as well, so it, it will just lock in there rather than rather than that sort of nice move. But I like the nice move. Isn't that cool? So uh, you're welcome to use that if you want. We don't really want to do any of this, though. I was just showing you the plasma pods there. Let's go see what is next in the tutorial. If you're in the Zim editor, use this code. Ah, right. So in the editor, we would do the same assets and path, but we don't have access to the frame call. So instead, we'll use frame.load assets, and then we get a complete event, and all of our code would go in that complete event when our assets are loaded. That's how we used to do Zim for about five years or so, and then we changed to, to load. So all the time, if you wanted assets, you would load the frame first, then you would use the frame.load assets, and you would end up having a complete event and then the end of the ready. Uh, and then we realized, okay, well, sometimes we just want them all at the beginning. Let's make it so that our frame will also load assets, and therefore we use that less. But you're still welcome to use that. Say you've got different parts to your app, and you don't really need assets for the second part until you get to the second part, then you can use the uh, frame.load assets anytime you want. Okay. Sprite. Right. This is a sprite sheet, really. Um, a sprite sheet has, well, uh, let's go there, top. Uh, if we go under code, I think it is. Right here is interactive animation. This is a sprite sheet right here of Dr. Abstract, and then up here is the sprite where it will animate that shortly. There, it animates it. What we have in this one is it animates forward, and then we wait for a bit. So this is a wait, and then it animates backwards. <laughs> it's kind of neat. So uh, we piggyback on Zim Animate. Animate. Zim Animate is very powerful, as powerful as Greensock, if not more and very simple and beautiful. It's wonderful to have Zim Animate. So we made run of this sprite match Zim Animate. So here we have rewind and loop is here. We have rewind wait and loop wait. Both of those are in place and we can rewind and loop a sprite. Uh, isn't that cool? Um, all right, so coming on down here is another example of a sprite where this guy is walking around. And we can change the speed of a sprite as well. So that's a sprite. It's made from a sprite sheet. And we can shoot. <coughs> Therefore, it will play different frames as we're shooting. So uh, sprite sprites have frames. And what it is doing is playing that image quickly so that it looks like it's got motion. That's what animation is. All right. Another way that we can use sprites though is as what's called a texture atlas and that's what games use as well uh, they would have a big picture a single picture filled with little treasures and stars and even even logos and fonts and stuff like that or well not fonts exactly but words <clears throat> they might put that all in a sprite sheet and then go to certain frames to show the picture and that's what we're going to be doing here so let's take a look and see how we do that we make a new sprite from our plasma pod. So copy that and let's put it in here instead of the pick with the boundaries. 
Our pod is going to be a new sprite. We load the image and this is a 10 by 10 sprite. Sometimes sprites have data, uh, a JSON file filled with data because they've been packed in with a thing called Texture Packer uh, or some other tool like Texture Packer. And if we bring in data, we would, we would pass it in here, um, some data.json like that. And that data would also point to the picture. So we would preload the picture, we would preload the data, and then in here we would just put the data like that. And that's our sprite. It's pretty amazing. Right? This is way easier than anybody else's sprite. Uh, we're like 60% uh, of the code of Phaser, for instance, which is a game engine, of CreateJS, et cetera, even, even more. So we've got our sprite down to really, really easy. <laughs> Yay. Um, so there's a 10 by 10 sprite right there. We don't have any data.json there. And we're centering it and we're registering it in the center as well. So that means if we were to spin it, the registration points about, uh, it's a point about which an object will rotate, about which it will scale, where it get, how it gets positioned and stuff like that. So sometimes we want to center edge it. Uh, we want to center edge our pod in this case so that when we put a circle around the pod saying we've selected this one, it just becomes easy. We locate the circle at the, at the pod. Um, normally a sprite would be rectangular with its anything rectangular usually has its registration point at the top left corner. So by center regging or another way to do it is reg, reg center. But, uh, and we may resort to that, but right now we also want to put it on the stage. So that does all of that. And then we're running it over 50 seconds. And that's because we got a hundred of them. So we're going to end up seeing this sprite every half a second. We'll see a new sprite. It's like a little preview of our sprites there. You like? Aren't they nice? Um, it's not really what we want to do, though. We want to, to make it so that it will uh, go to a certain frame. And so we would get rid of that, and we would say pod.frame is equal to uh, 50. So there's the, the 50th frame, and we'll see what that looks like. Okay, and that's in, at index 50. So now we've got that picture. If we made another one, we uh, might go, let's see what's at number 10. Oh, it's that one. Okay, and so that gives us a bunch of images all in one picture. So that's nice on mobile, it loads that one picture and it loads it, a sprite sheet will get load, loaded into the GPU just once like that. And referencing it any number of times after is, um, is really fast. So it's the same picture. If we make a new sprite, it's, it knows it's in the GPU. In other words, emitting a picture like this, emitting a sprite is better than emitting anything else. So uh, it's fast. All right, uh, that's that. Let's see what's next. How are you guys doing? Yay! So uh, we're coming along. We're, we're getting our, our assets in there. We got lots to go. So once again, you're always welcome to pause and get a cookie. What are we doing with this one? We are setting up tile. Let's tile the pod. Okay, right. Oh, right. So we're going to tile it right here. We're tiling the pod. There's our reg center that we mentioned. And then we're going to loop through and set the frames for each of them. So God, crap that code right there. And I think it's just going to replace all that. And we format our document. So there it is. Now we're not needing to add it to the stage because we're going to tile it on the stage. So we're just centering the reg this way, reg center. We're setting the calls in rows for our tile. We're preparing so that we can go across levels. Like if we pull these out rather than hard code them right in our tile, we can just change these numbers to go to a different level with more. And we're tiling our pod at that calls in rows and spacing. We're scaling it to the stage. So this is kind of nice. Scale to the stage, 95% or 95% the height. Uh, we probably don't need to worry about the height on this. It would just be the width that's getting in the way there. And then we're centering it on the stage. We're looping through all the pods. Pods 
Uh, Zim's got a loop, which is like a for loop, except it's very handy. So it does a whole variety of things. We can loop through a number, we can loop through an array, we can loop through an object literal, we can loop through a container. And so here we are looping through a container. When we loop through the container, we can use it as a method, pods.loop, we get a pod. Uh, alternatively, you can just use the loop function, uh, like so. Loop through pods, get a pod. Loop 10 times, do this function. Loop through an array, some array, two comma three, get each element. And also get i if you want, and also get the total. Anyway, we'll go back to just our nice simple loop through the pods. We each, each time we get a pod, and we're setting the frame to some random number. Uh, let's have a look and see what we get. But can you imagine a problem with that? Hmm, I see it right away. Those two are the same. So we, we're randomly getting but that might be neat. Which ones are the same? <laughs> you know, like it's another type of game. I'm, I'm matching. Can you match them all up? Uh, you're probably already thinking of some sort of flip game where, oh, if I flip these and show the pods, I'd have to match the pods. This would be a really pretty one to do, wouldn't it? Um, a matching game. We, we do a lot of those. All right. Anyway, so we're getting random, uh, random ones there, but... I keep on forgetting that what I'm looking at is at the same place as a tutorial. I don't usually follow a tutorial like this. All right, so down we go. Brrrp. Unique pods, so how do we get unique pods? Well, here's a way to get unique pods. Copy that. Probably a few different ways. And where is that starting? That was starting through the loop through, okay. <clears throat> So we're making an array called options, an empty one. We're going to loop 100 times. Ah, oh, there's the loop 100 each time we get i. And we're going to push i into options. So in other words, we're going to get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 99 there. So that's all 100 possibilities, indexes, that is. And then we shuffle them. So we've shuffled the options. We're looping through each uh, pod uh, in our tile and setting it to options at i. Because we've shuffled them, we'll just grab the first, you know, whatever that is, 20 of them. Okay, so when we loop through the pods, we're looping, we're getting 20 of them here, and then just getting the first 20 of our random ones, and that will get unique pods. This, this example has a lot of array work, so if you've never done programming before, sometimes arrays are a little bit tricky for people, but basically it's a list of things so those are all unique now. It's a list of things that have an index that start at zero. So uh, we have an items array. The tile has an items array, a property called items. This would be at zero, at one, at two, at three. So that's how we say it, the items at zero, at one, two, three, et cetera. And the length of that is always one bigger than the index because we start at zero. In other words, if we've got 20 things here, the length is 20, but this will be index 19. Okay, that's a little bit about arrays. And you can sort arrays, you can push, you, you can push, pop, shift, and unshift. Those are methods of the array to add things at the end and at the beginning and take away from the end and take away from the beginning. You have to remember which one's which. Anyway, push is adding to the end, for instance. So, you know, the, those are array methods. What other ones do we have? We can splice and s slice and splice. <laughs> slice gets a part of an array and sort of keeps it as a new array. And splice takes a part out of an array and makes that a new array too. Um, anyway, so those are some things. We're going to be using some of those as we go through here. All right, back to here. So now we have uniques. Eternals. Some of these uh, need to be eternal, as uh, that's what we're calling it. So some that remain in the same place, we want to call eternals. And we got a lot of array manipulation going on here. Here's setting up the eternals. So let's copy this code and see what, we, what we're doing. And that's right up from the sprite here because we've added a level, level zero. And we said how many are stable, but we'll talk about that once we get into the code. I guess all of this, 
right from the sprite paste and format document <clears throat> okay so there's our sprite the sprite didn't change but we did add levels so we're now imagining we're on level zero and these are the number of stables so stables are for the in internal the number is uh, the level so zero plus two that's how we've worked it out so we're on level zero our very first level we'll have two that remain the same when we're on level one we'll have three and level two we'll have four etc right so stable is the number that we keep stable and our pods are the same as before our options are the same as before and now our eternals our eternals are options and we're going to splice starting at zero so this is where we start we're going to splice the stable number so in other words two of them for the first le level we're splicing two that deletes two so zero and one are gone now and it returns when we splice it returns an array with whatever we deleted so eternals now are indexes of those it might be 57 33 or it could be 22 19. okay so that's what eternals would be when we go up a level when we go up a level this number will increase and we'll end up storing three eternals that are spliced from our shuffled stuff and you'll see that we end up uh, running all this code each level so we'll reshuffle them basically each level as well all right now we need the location of those and this is in our grid so in our tile which indexes are those all spots so how we're going to do that we need to know the which we don't want to repeat in other words we want to get um, two unique numbers from that and that's a little bit tricky we can't just say randomly pick out a 20 like there's 20 uh, five the calls times rows we can't randomly pick from that because the next time we might end up randomly picking the same number again so how we're dealing with that it's not the only way maybe but how we're dealing with it is we're creating an array of all the available spots if we wanted to we could have rolled the random number and then rolled the random number again and check to see if it's different than the previous one and do a while loop that would be called a while loop but rather than a while loop we're we're just doing it this way okay where we make all the spots we take rows times calls and we uh, get the index each time and we push the spots there so basically this is getting us 0 to 19 okay 0 to 19 those are all the index spots in the tile we shuffle those and we splice two of them so we shuffled this is a zim oh, we talked about it we didn't talk about it here did we shuffle basically scrambles it um okay and then we uh, splice two of them so now we have an array of two indexes this might be instead of something like 57 and 92 right it's not out of 100 this is now out of only 20 so it would be something like 12 and 3 or 6 and 0 okay and that gives us our index spots for those eternals and now we're back to our loop here so we loop through all we position the frame so we're setting the frame of this pod uh, we're letting the index okay so now we're looking we're using the index of which is a method of an array to find out what index a a certain object is so now we're passing an i so as we loop through the pods all of the pods this will give us uh, you know 0 to 19 if we're on 0 if 0 is inside of the spots then we're going to let index be um, which index it is so if zero is the first thing in there the index would be zero if zero is the second thing in the spots the index would be one if zero is not in the spots the index is negative one okay so as long as the index is greater than zero that means it's in the spots so if it is in the spots we're setting the frame it, we did set it to just a random thing but now we're going to override that we're setting the frame 
to whatever uh, Eternals index is in spots. So remember, spots holds. Oh yeah, that that would be the index. Yeah. No, wait a minute. Uh, spots is different than. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah. There we got a couple of different arrays here. Spots. It, what is spots holding? Spots holds the indexes. And then at the index, it would be the spot. So what is that? That's the, it's not the eternal frame though, is it? Or is it? It's the, um, oh yeah, I think we might have actually a slight bug there. That really should be the, let's see, the index. That should be eternals, eternals, adjust that. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe it didn't make all that much of a difference. We, we couldn't tell as, as we were testing this earlier. But okay. Uh, there we go. So we pull Eternals at that index. Let's, we're going to do a test on that. So here's the test right here. Um, as we loop through the spots, we're getting the index and we're locating a circle. So this is looping through the spots. We're going to locate a circle at pods at that index. So pods.items. So pods.items is an array that belongs to the tile. And we have the index and that we're getting that from spots. Okay, so these are our spots. So in other words, if we were holding something at the zero spot and at the 20 spot, oh, we can't, a zero spot and the 19 spot, that would be the very first, the very end, um, we would put a circle around those. Speaking of putting a circle around, let's just see what this looks like, and then we'll talk about putting the circle around. Let's come back here and make sure that all this is still working. We refresh, and there we have a circle around those two spots. And now we've got a circle around these two spots. Okay, so how did how do we put this circle around there? Let's have a look at it. It does look like it's working fine with the Eternals there. And here's the circle. We're setting it to the pod width divided by two. So another circles are a radius. So we want the radius here. So that's a pod's width divided by two. That looks great. We did something else here. We'll just take that out for now. We've set the color of it to be clear so that we can't see the middle of the circle, but there's the border color of the circle is white and the width is 10. We're also setting a style up here as dashed. So when it makes that circle, it's going to use this style and be dashed. Then we're locating the circle at the pods item um, at the index. So whatever, this is a little bit tricky looking because we're looping through spots. Spots is an array and we're getting the index. This is not I though. This is not zero and one. That's the next parameter, I, or the next spot there. Okay, this is actually a value from the array. When we loop through spots, we're getting the values. And it happens to be that that value is an index within the tile. Okay, it's not zero, one, or that if we're looping only spots, this will be two spots to start, then it'll be three spots. So then it would be zero, one, two. But the index is one of the random numbers that we put in there. As in, when we're here, the index was zero, one, two, three, four. Five, and then whatever that is, 19, 18, 17. Four and 17 are indexes there. Okay, so just don't think that it's the index I, that's all. Uh, all right, so we're looping through the spots, we're locating it at that, uh, at that index. And what were we wanting to test there? Right, we took away something here, so let's refresh. Now, do you see how those are slightly bigger then the, and this might change depending on how much we scale this. Let's, uh, let's try a bigger, I'm gonna go to six here and 10 there and let's see what we get. Okay, now we've got more of these pods and look at our ring. Our ring now is way too big. So what's going on here? Why is that the case? The reason is the tile, the things inside the tile have been scaled 
so that they fit on the stage. You see how these are now smaller? They've been scaled to fit on the stage. But when we add the ring, we're, we're taking the width of the, of the pod, but that width is inside a scaled container. So the width is actually bigger in there than, than what we're seeing here. So the width is big, this big, but because we're then scaling down the tile, uh, the, the actual pod is smaller. So what we need to do is multiply here. We need to multiply this by the scale of the tile. Times our tile, which is pods, uh, dot scale. Okay, so what, if the scale of this were half as big, we're going to end up making this radius half as big. Right? If we save this and come back here. Oh, it worked. Okay, now our outside, because the difference is, is this circle is located on the stage. So by default, it's on the stage. This is our Y value, which is null, and this is S. So we've located this circle on the stage by default. We could have possibly located this inside of pods. If we locate it inside of pods, then we wouldn't need to change the scale. And we might want to do that, but then all the rings that we're making are going inside of pods, and that might cause us problems as we're looping through the pods in some way that mixes things. We've got then rings inside there as well as pods, and I'd rather just keep them pods inside of that tile. Right? So we're not adding it to, uh, to pods, but instead to the stage, and therefore we have to adjust for the scale. All right, good. How are you doing? <laughs> Confused? <laughs> so, uh, oh, we need to undo and go back to, what was it, our 20 as well. So that was four here and five here. And now we're back to a check. And by the way, we're putting just those rings there as a check. Those are our, our ternals. Those are the ones that would not be changing. And now what we need to do is we need to loop through the rest of them or, or do an interval through the rest of them and keep on changing the all the other ones and leave these two the same. All right, so that's our, our next step, most likely. We come down here, interval. All right, so we're gonna use a Zim interval and that's got the seconds first and the function to call next. So here it is right here, there's the Zim interval. Copy that. And we put that down in here. And do our blah, 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 format. We're storing it in a variable. Normally we don't have to. We could make an interval just like that. And that's the zim interval right there. If you come from JavaScript, I'm sure you've heard of set interval, right? Like that where we have to use the word set. And there's also a set timeout. In Zim, we've got interval and timeout. In JavaScript, set interval, set timeout. The difference is Zim interval puts us the seconds first um, versus an arrow function comes first here. Oh, sorry. Arrow function comes first here. And then, like the problem with this is start doing the function. This is us working on the function. You forget to put the time in there. And that's in milliseconds. So they put the time afterwards. Almost everything we do, if we make an event on click, call this function. Uh, loop 10 times, call this function. So everything that we're doing is blah, blah, call this function, blah, blah, call this function. And then set interval comes along and it's call this function, blah, blah. It's like the reverse. We Milliseconds are okay, but we've converted back in Zimcat. We converted all of our stuff into seconds. It's just easier for kids and for all of us, I really think. All right, so uh, there you go. There is a time, T-I-M-E, all capitals. You can set that equal to milliseconds if you want to go everything back to milliseconds. Again, you're welcome to do that. Anyway, there's set inter or interval there, and there's our function that we're going to run right here. Some other nice things about the Zim interval, here's one of them. This is how many times it runs, so we could run 10 times. This next one right here is whether we want to start right away. 
instead of waiting our first second, we, we can start right away. And because we're starting right away and we're looping through the pods and uh, we're shuffling the options, we're looping through the pods and doing stuff, we actually don't need this loop through the pods right here. Uh, we'll need the style turned on for now. I get, oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong thing. Okay, we don't need this loop through the pods right here. This loop through the pods is, is applying the dashed, which we can still do, but let's move that then after this, I think. In the tutorial, we might have advised to remove that. I'm not sure. Maybe it wouldn't matter. I'm not sure. But we're not going to need this loop through the pods. You see how this is uh, frame.options? There it is right there. So we've already got this. And we're going to do that right away. Also, the shuffling. Well, we shuffle there. The options. I guess it won't matter if we shuffle again here. Probably don't need to. So we shuffle here. We. Those are options. Yeah. Um, all right, I can't remember what we do with the shuffle of the options if we're going to repeat that because we are splicing our eternals there, which we probably need. Okay, so for now we'll leave both of them in there. Do we need to shuffle them on our interval? Yes, we do need to shuffle in the interval. Yeah, it probably won't matter. The options got spliced. Yeah, it won't matter. So we took the eternals out of the options. The splicing takes those eternals out. And then we're shuffling the options that are left each interval. And yeah, that's fine. We just reshuffle the ones, it won't matter. Okay, so um, in, an, in the interval then, we're going to loop through them, apply the frames, get the index, and yeah, all that stuff is the same as it was before. And we update the stage. We don't want to do it 10 times, but do you want to do it three times? Well, how about we do it five times? Okay, there we go. Let's try it out. Refresh here, ran right away, and there's our each second, and I can see it ran five times. Um, but there's our Eternals. Our Eternals are staying there, and the rest of them are, now let's take off the, the five, and set this to null, or undefined, it's up to you. Null is just half as much typing. <laughs> I'm kind of peeved at JavaScript for for doing that. Basically, how it works is in ES6, undefined will trigger default parameters. Before, we would often use null to trigger undefined parameters, but in ES6, they decided that null, it's, it would be nice to have a way that we can pass in a null value if we wanted to. So they made null not trigger un, um, parameters that were undefined. Okay, uh, which I use that null, like I would use, I would want to pass in a null to a function about once every 300 things I make. So to me, that's not worth it. And there'd be other ways around that. <laughs> I can pass in a negative one or something like that if I really want and collect it in a certain way. So to me, it's not worth it. I would much rather just have nulls trigger default parameters, but whatever. Uh, I guess that ship has sailed. It's not going to happen. I should have gotten involved in open source and fought before it was decided. <laughs> uh, and I kind of understand the decisions. So that's fine. But see that? Eternals. All the time while I was talking to you, blah, 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 blah. Um, all these ones are changing, and there's our Eternals. Aren't they great? Uh, nice. So that's almost the game, isn't it? Well, oh, we have to figure out, though, if we click on them, did we press the right ones? Oh, yeah. Okay. So is that what we're going to do next? Uh, we can comment out our test. So that's, oh, yeah, let's comment out our test so that we can try it. Oh, yeah. So here's our test. Comment that out. Actually, just delete the thing. Well, leave it commented out for now, just in case we want to reference it. And we refresh here. Mmm. Ah, this one is right there. And that one is. Okay, these two. But I'm clicking on them, and they're not telling me, yeah, that, that I've done it right. So interaction. Now we want to press on the pods and see if we get the right answer. So we're adding a mouse down to the pods, and there's the cur on the pods. So we're adding a mouse down to the pods. Let's copy that. This is just after we made the pod. 
sort of doesn't matter, but coming up, I'll try and keep it in the same order. There's our pods. Ah, dot cur. We didn't add it to that. I thought we did. But that must have been some other version of it. And format or document. Definitely format your document. I'm not used to pulling from a tutorial like this. I'm used to just typing it in. Definitely you want to keep your formatting as you go. So if you saw what, don't leave it like that. Don't, don't leave it like this. Don't, you know, you've got to make sure you format and you can figure out a hotkey if you want to do this a lot. I don't usually do it a lot because like I said, I'm coding right away and all of my code keeps indenting because this is your box. Here's what we do inside this bracket, bracket to bracket. That indent is your box saying, this is what I'm doing when I mouse down. So that makes your code almost twice as easy, I would say. Well, maybe a third easier than it would be if you weren't keeping your indenting. Okay. So mouse down. When we mouse down, we're collecting our event object. We're assigning the event object to the pod. Often we'll do that if we want to use it more than once. I think we're probably going to do more than just remove it. So we're preparing ourselves to have this nice, easy word, pod. That's, that's what we've pressed on, the pod. Okay, rather than using e.target this, e.target that, e.target this. Um, all right, so e.target is what in, inside was pressed on. By the way, if you ever want what was pressed on, like what object in general was pressed on, that is called current target. It's a really bad per, per, uh, property name, current target. So that would be the whole tile. So now if pod is the whole tile and we remove it, here's what we would see. Refresh here and I press on this one. Oh, they all went away. Oh. Okay, so that's how you get all of them. But if we want to know specifically which one in the container was pressed, that's called e.target. And now let's try it. Boop, disappear, disappear. Okay, so that gets us ready. Yeah, okay, now we know how to collect that. And let's see what we do next. That made them disappear. Wrong or right? Now we want to find out if they're wrong or right. So this is the code in our mouse down. It will do that. We'll copy that. We'll bring it into this whole thing, mouse down, and format our document. Okay, so find out, let's see, so e.target is the specific pod, and if we ask for the tile num, uh, luckily Zim, when we make a tile, gives each of the elements of a tile a tile num. It also gives it a row num and a call num if you want, or a call num, row num, I think, or something like that. But anyway, we want the tile num. That will be zero for the first one, 19 for the last one, any one we'll get in between. And we're going to ask, is that in spots? So is that tile num that we pressed in spots? Because spots are is the array that holds the indexes in the tile of our eternals. And we're storing that as end. Once again, if that's greater than or equal to zero, then that means it's in there. It's inside of spots. Otherwise, it's minus one, and we've got the wrong one. So it looks like here we're... Did we... <laughs> we no longer stored e.target in pod. Did we? <laughs> so now we're using e.target here, and we're using e.target here. And for some reason, we took away the nice, easy reference to it. But anyway, well leave it as it is for now. Maybe we'll fix it later. Okay, so um, there we're setting the scale to half as big. And that's just a temporary, we're, we've got to do something to show that it's wrong. And we're updating the stage after the conditional. But if we're right, then we're going to put the circle around it. Ah, yeah, so that's our circle that we had commented out down below. So it's the same circle with the, the dash thing. So, yeah, no, we don't need that. And up here, there we are putting the circle around it and it's style dash. We did change this to say once colon true. And that will make sure that if we set a style in here, then uh, anything made after it would get that style. So we're saying only do that once. And as we make that circle, that's the once. So dash true and then that style will go away. 
So we save that up. By the way, Zin has style, uh, which is very much like CSS. It's got some other cool properties. Plus, we can use the we can use the um, Zim V values, the dynamic parameters in there as well, and that makes it really cool. Remember the series, for instance. Imagine we're making five buttons. We can set a series of labels or a series of colors or whatever, and then each button that gets made would get in that order, would get the label. It's kind of like Ant Child, but I think better and easier. So here we go. Ah, here we go. Wrong one. Oh, wrong one. Oh, wrong one. Ah, right one. Okay, so now we've got the, the Eternals have been matched, and we've got the wrong ones. Well, we've matched two, but there won't be any more, so we probably should finish this level and go to the next level after that. Okay. Oh, that's in here. What happens? Level complete. So how are we know we're done guessing? So what we're going to do, and the other thing is, we could guess the same one over and over again. If we got points for guessing the right one, <laughs> this has happened in some games I found, you get points for guessing the right one, well, what if I guess it again and again and again? <laughs> I keep on getting the points for guessing it. It doesn't matter so much in this case, but it might keep on putting circles over top of it, which, which might not look the best eventually. Sometimes the dithering on it will uh, start showing up little pixel corners and stuff like that if you keep on overlapping the same image or the same shape. Uh, anyway, yeah, we want to find out. So what we're going to do is make an array called correct. There's the pods. Here's the mouse down. And there's a function called next level down there at the bottom. So I'm copying all this stuff and putting it in here. So that was the pods. I put the cursor on the pods. Yeah, I did. And then setting the frames, do we need that? No, just into here, that's it. Paste and format document. So we've added uh, an array and every time we get one correct, we're going to add it to the array. Therefore, uh, if the number that's in the array matches our stable, then we're done the label, <laughs> done the level, sorry. <laughs> stable label, then we're done the level. Okay, and not only that, but we're only going to want to pick one. It's going to be right if it's not already in the correct. Um, okay, so let's see how that changes down here. We got our mouse down. If the if it's in the index, so if it's in the spots, so if the one we picked is in the spots, and not included in the correct. So if our index is not included in the correct, that's what that means, not. And then this is this is in a way that we can find, it's another way to find out if something's in an array. If we don't need the index, so index of will give you the index, but if you just want to find out if something's in the array, includes makes a little more sense. Does correct include the index is what we're saying, but it won't give us an index number. It gives us a Boolean. Whereas this gives us the index number, which we needed to know. Actually, we didn't need to know it here, but we need to know it here. Okay, so that's why we used it, is so that we can push that index in the correct. But I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so if it's correct and not already chosen, we're going to set the circle. Oh, I wasn't that much ahead of myself. And we're going to push it into the correct. Remember those methods of the array that we mentioned? Push, we'll just add it on to the end of the array. And the array is this one right here, correct. Great. If the length of that array is equal to our stable, then we're ready to go to the next label. <laughs> stable label. Oh my God. Navel, navel, stable label. Stable navel. How about that? Uh, we're ready to go to the next level. <laughs> okay. And there's the next level right there. There's the function that will that we can run when we're ready to go to the next level level we could have put it all in here in squiggly brackets if we wanted to but we decided to break it out here okay so we'll see that this is a zog that's how we log to the console we would normally log to a console just like that but we can also log with colors so this would log in red this would log in green this would log <laughs> nothing <laughs> this would log in blue sorry this would log in pink 
All right, so we got a bunch of them in there that you can use. Um, we're going to do green because we're, hey, it's the next level. This is great, green. All right, so let's see. F12, we'll, we'll pull that up. We have to get to the next level, though. So that's in here, and we refresh. Hmm. <laughs> nope. Oh, this one. Yay, one more. Uh-oh, I thought I saw two that looked the same there. And here's the one more. Bop. Well... F12. So here's F12, and sure enough, we got next level, although, darn, we weren't looking at it, I forgot. So F12 is their console over here, uh, or you can choose from this little thing in Chrome and more tools, developer tools, or you can right-click here and inspect, but if you inspect, it pulls up this first, then you have to go over to the console. So just get your F12 going, and let's see, there's one. So F12 is not zogging it yet. There's one, and here's one. Next level, yay, okay, good. And now how do we handle levels? So levels, Ooh. all right. We are probably going to put it all in a function. So if we put everything that we've made into a function, we can just keep on running that function for every new level. We have to increase our level number as we go. So here we are preparing for some of that. Here's the data for the levels. Why don't we put that? Uh, so all this stuff comes up underneath levels. Copy that. And we're also going to have to, because we're clearing it, uh, we need to clear an interval each time. We've got to do some adjustments there. Okay. So all of this is up under levels right here. And we format the document. So that's still the same. So this is how many calls and rows. Calls and rows. Calls are X, rows are Y. We always do X, Y, calls, rows. And note that they, they don't quite follow a pattern. Four, um, four, five, six, seven, eight do, but then we have five and then seven, that's up by two and then only up by one. Oh, and then we go up by two and then up by one. So it does follow a pattern, but rather than try and figure out how to do the up by two, up by one, up by two, up by one. <laughs> we could do that, I suppose. But uh, we just decided to hard code our levels. We've only got five of them. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so this data represents our levels, and that's how many levels we have, five as well. We're setting up so that we can animate out the last bunch of pods and have the current bunch of pods at the same time. And we're also declaring interval out here because we want to clear the interval. That interval, which is going through the numbers, we want to do it, do a different interval function later. So we need to clear the old interval function, which means down below where we did the interval, right here. Oh. <laughs> We, did, we took it out. Uh, slack inter equals. We would have, if we were following the tutorial properly, had a const inter, or perhaps it was a let inter, I can't remember. We would have had a const interval there. Uh, I think we called it a let right away. Um, anyway, we don't want that anymore. I had taken out the whole thing by accident. This represents or remembers our interval so that we can clear it later. And then up here is where we declared that. We also set up a container to hold our rings. So as we go from one level to another, we're gonna have two rings the first time, three rings the next time. And we need to get rid of those rings so that we can bring back new rings, I guess. Uh, anyway, we're making a container, the same width and stage as the height. That's a nice, easy way we add it to, there's no point in loc or pose or center there. We just add to because it's the same size as a stage. It'll automatically get added at zero, zero because that's the default X and Y. So there we go, we've got rings. And now we're going to add the rings to the rings container. What that allows us to do is animate out the rings container altogether rather than each ring. Uh, or we could clear the things that are in the ring by just uh, rings.remove all children with round brackets, that's a function to be able to remove all children in, and that would clear it all. 
we could loop through the things in the rings if we wanted to, like we looping through thing, like we're looping through the things in the tile. Tile is a container. It's just a special container that has things already in place in, in the tile. <laughs> All right, blah bitty blah bitty blah. And let's go back and see what we got to do next or what we have to do next. Set the interval, right? We did that. Make level. Okay, so now we're making our function. The function is going to be called make level. And it goes up just above the call to the tile here. All right, all right. We'll put that in and then we'll take a look at it. And we're going to have to do the end of the make level all the way down below. So this was right here. I think we're duplicating some things. Yeah. So we're no longer hard coding four and five. We're getting rid of all that stuff. And we're doing something a little bit different. Oh, we have a function there, first of all. So all this stuff is going to be needed, needing to be indented. Boop. So we indent all this, tab. We come back down here and we end that. That's the end of make level. All right, so if we put that in a function, which we got all that stuff's in a function now called make level, we can collapse that. Okay, there's all of make level just got collapsed and now we bring it all back. We're gonna need to call it. So if we look at this now, we should see nothing because we didn't call make level. Nothing. Ah. All right, so we have to call make level. We could call it above if we wanted to right here, make level, we can kind of see it. Or we can call it down below. I think the tutorial calls it down below, but this will be hoisted. JavaScript has a thing called hoisting. So you might wonder, uh, don't we have to make it before we can call it? No, uh, it looks through and any declaration like that gets hoisted to the top. So we can do this. Uh, however, we have, we have, However, um, in the tutorial, put it down there at the bottom. All right, so this will run make level, and everything should be basically the same as it was before. Yep, seems that way. What about these guys? Do they work? Bap, and, mm, and mm, eh, bap. Okay, good. That's wrong. There's the next level. So we're the same as we were before. And that's good. And that's what we added down there at the bottom of that. So make sure that it still runs. It does. Yay. And nothing has changed because we haven't done the advancing of the levels. Hmm. Okay. So what does this say? Oh, right. The rings. This is a little bit about the rings. We're going to locate them at e.target. I never really, I don't know. Did I explain that? Let's explain it now. I may have already explained it. Can't remember. But we go into the rings here. There they are. And there's our loc. Bring that down. Locating it right now at e.target on the stage, but instead we're going to locate it at e.target. That what loc does is it locates it at an x and a y. So really, this is how we started. Locate at e.target. Period. Target dot y. So this is locate receives the X, the Y, and what container. So that would work as well. We're going to locate it at the e.target X, e.target Y, and now we're going to put it in rings. But if your object already has an X and Y, then we can just say locate it at that target or at that location or at that object. We're going to locate it at that object. That object already has an X and Y property and then we don't need to specify this. So here we can put null or undefined. Okay, that makes it really easy. If we didn't care about uh, the container, we just do that. Hey, locate it at, so if we have a new emitter, locate it at that, um, at that person or at the player and the emitter gets put at the X and Y of the player, right? Now that we need to specify the, the container we're going to put this in, we have to skip this parameter with a null or an undefined there. Okay, so none, de none defined. Undefined. There we go. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Except that's twice as long, or if not longer. 
Alrighty, so great, that's the rings. That's just a little bit of housekeeping. Now add above the function next level. This is next level, not make level. So we've got next level and make level. Okay, so up above the function next level, there's the function next level. We're just zogging next level right there. We want to handle the levels. So we're preparing for stuff to handle the levels. And so all this goes above the next level. There's the next level that goes in there and we format document. All right, so handling levels, what do we do? We are taking the pods and we're setting the pods alpha to zero. And we're going to animate them up to an alpha of one. And we're going to wait uh, last pods. So we set setting last pods to pods. So if we already have a last pods, that means we're on some future level and we're going to wait a little bit of time. But if we don't have last pods, that means we're on the first level, then we're going to wait zero. So in other words, the very first time we didn't even need this. So let's temporarily delete that and just have a look. Set the pods to zero in the alpha and then animate the alpha to one in 0.5. As a matter of fact, if we didn't have the last pods, these two things are the first parameters. The, the weight is not that the weight is more parameters later. Let's just take a quick look at our animate parameters here. I don't know where we have those the docs. Animate, animate, animate. So here are the animate param parameters, parameters, props, the time. The ease, the call, the params, the weight. So we'd have to go null, 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 and then get to the weight. So instead of doing that, we decided to go to the Zim Duo technique. That especially happens when you have loop or rewind. Look, here's rewind way the heck down here. So you don't want to go null, 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 null. So as soon as you go into loop and rewind, you definitely want to go the Zim Duo. Because look at all these parameters. All right, so we would drop to the Zim Duo technique. But in this case, if we don't have the weight, so if we get rid of that, we wouldn't go to the Zim Duo technique because the first parameter is props, the second parameter is time. So you just get rid of that and go alpha to zero in the time of 0 0.5, with the comma, and then get rid of that one. And that would be your animate. So animate the alpha to one, and these could be other things too. It could be the, uh, could be the comma scale, sake. How the heck did I do that? <laughs> so I deleted everything on the page trying to type the word scale. Scale colon uh, 32, 33. We definitely want this to be bigger. So this would animate the alpha to one and the scale to 33 and any other props that we want um, can go inside there. But right now we only want the alpha to one in 0.5. And if we said that it would be in one second. Isn't that cool? Start off with alpha zero, and even that, you, you don't need it. You could set the alpha to zero, or set, uh, right, set is another parameter though, so we'd have to go back to the squiggly set alpha zero. Um, anyway, yeah, we, probably easiest to set the alpha first and do that. Isn't that cool? So Zim animate is very, very simple. That's simple. That's more simple than, um, certainly than CSS, by at least half. And uh, if you come from GreenSock, just be careful. Greensock is to some degree uh, more simple because you can mix these things in. So if, green, if you have the time in Greensock. So first of all, I don't think that Greensock has normal parameters. I think it gets these, these types of squiggly bracket parameters. And then what you do is everything's in the squiggly brackets and you can say alpha to one, scale to 33, time to 0.5. We don't do that. So that's GreenSock, and it does make it simple because you can just add in at any time you want a property that you want to animate. But what we've done is we've grouped the properties like that and saying, no, 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 you can't just throw in a property anytime. We're like that prop, or is it props? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember, I think it's props, plural. So the props are these, and the time is that, and then the E's might be something like that. But anyway, so that's the slight difference between GreenSock and Zim. Uh, GreenSock 
is one slight level simpler in that you can just throw any properties you want in at any time. We've grouped them under a props and therefore we have a nested uh, squiggly brackets, which can be a little bit problematic. You see what I mean? We've got nested squiggly brackets. But the other thing is we don't have to have squiggly brackets. So it can be just this, which is pretty easy. And then the next thing is your ease, the type of ease, linear or whatever, bounce or elastic. Anyway, I better undo this and get back to where we were. Hopefully that's okay to do that. <laughs> I wonder if I'll undo the fact when we deleted the whole document. Uh, there we go. No, we made it. All right. So that's how we were, where we're adding in a little weight there as well. These are things that we're doing as we go from one level to another. We're remembering our last pods so that we can uh, do some adjustments there. We might do use the last pods later as well. We're also clearing any rings. So, oh, we're showing the rings. So we're putting the rings on top. Each level that we go, the rings container was made possibly underneath. So the rings container is made outside, isn't it? Yeah. So there's make levels. The rings container was made just once outside. So any new pods that get made, this new tile, when we center them on the stage like that, it's going to go up on top of the rings. So now we're telling the rings to go up on the top. So Zim has top. It's got bot if we want to put them at the bot. And it's also got ord like that. And we could say ord2. That moves it up two levels. These are stacking layers, the layers like Photoshop layers kind of thing. And each each container has its own set of layers. Right now we're dealing with the stage. So these are the or the layers on the stage. Uh, but we might be in some other container and then we'd be dealing with that. So anyway, these are the, the rings container, which is on the stage. We'd move it up to, or we could move it down to, or back one or something. But anyway, we want top. We want to come up to the top like that. Then we're going to animate them to alpha zero and have them come back. So basically, when we change levels, the rings will animate to zero, and then the rings will animate back up to level one. We're also removing the children in between there in the rings call. So, or sorry, the rewind call. Rewind call calls a function as it, in between as it's rewinding. So it'll go forward, then it calls a function, then it rewinds. Okay, we've also got call. Call runs the function at the end. And if we're looping, we've got loop call. If we're waiting, we've got wait call. So there's a bunch of calls that can happen anytime in there. Great. Um, the next level. All right. I'm not sure what will happen if we run this now. Do we need to run it? Mm, let's have a look. Running. Boo, boo, boo. Do we want this? We want that. And we have to get through a level. Hmm, there. Hmm, there. Oh, <laughs> okay. We're only preparing. So it's still just calling next level. And what do we do in that next level? Okay, so inside the next level, here's the next level. This is what we're doing. And it looks like we're even getting to an end of the game. So all of this stuff is inside of next level. There's next level. Don't know if we need to zog it anymore and we format the document thank goodness so when we go to the next level we're caching the last pods so this is the set of pods that we were just working with we cache them and we animate them to an alpha of zero in this amount of time and then we dispose them so after we're done animating them down we uh, in the call we get past whatever it is we're animating, and then we're going to dispose that. That gets rid of it from memory. Okay, uh, why do we cache it? We don't have to cache it or like that. We could animate it out, but uh, that would probably be fine as well. Caching it will help a little bit, certainly with vectors. I don't even think it helps with this case. So this might have been left over from the dots. The dots are vectors. So dots are vectors, text is vectors, and if we're animating on mobile, we're animating 60 times per second, and 60 times per second it's having to redraw those vectors. 
Uh, it's better if it's just an image. The image is in cache, or if we cache it, then it's an image, and it gets redrawn on the GPU, or not even redrawn at all. I'm not sure which one, and it will be smoother. So that just makes animating smoother a bit on mobile, especially if what you're animating has a lot of text, and it certainly doesn't hurt. Okay, so it doesn't hurt for it to be in here. I think we're fine if we've already got a bunch of images. They'll be cached enough, but uh, like I said, doesn't hurt. Cache, by the way, if you come from CreateJS, Zim's built on CreateJS, and CreateJS was very popular, loaded billions of times, so sometimes people come from CreateJS into here. The CreateJS cache, you have to put in dimensions there. In Zim, we just figure the dimensions out for you and do that automatically. So, if you were wondering. We're clearing the interval. Hey, there we go. We're finally using that inter. So this is us, when we go to the next level, we clear the interval to stop it from giving us more, more orbs. Not, not yet, please. We got to remake this and make a new interval. So there is interval.clear. Uh, by the way, so here's an interval up here somewhere. I think we had it. Make level. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll definitely be in here somewhere. Where is that interval? Is it in here? Nope. Next level. It's not there. Interval. There it is. So here's the interval. If you want to clear it from the outside, you store it in a variable. Then you can clear it from the outside. If you want to clear it from the inside, we collect what's called the interval object, OBJ we usually call it. And then down in here, depending on what we're doing, so if something, something, something happens, uh, then OBJ.clear, like that. And so we can, inside this, we can use the interval object to clear it. And then we, we don't need to make that like that. We can just use the object. And the interval object has things like the count, like what number we're on. It has a pause and a few other things like that. Okay, and there's a clear. But anyway, we want to clear it from the outside. So we don't do it that way. We store it in a variable. Then we can clear it on the outside. And that's what we're doing. We're increasing our level. Yay. Okay, yeah, finally, we're going to see this work. We're increasing our level. And if the level is less than the levels dot length, levels is our data for the level. Remember that up here? Levels. So that has a length, and that tells us how many levels we have. And if our level number that we just made is less than that, then we make a new level. Remember where we are. We're in next level. Go to the next level. So we're going to make a new level if it's less than. Otherwise, we're at the end of the game. Yay! Okay, if we've reached the length, then we're at the end of the game, and the game is done. So I'm not going to bother testing. Well, we'll test the making of the le next level. Let's see how that goes. I won't go to the end of the game, though. All right, there's one. I found it, I found it, I found it. And two. Oh, nice, huh? And it fades out and it comes to the next level. Should we do three and see if that works one more time? Note that we've got more things on here. There's one. And do you see the other? You're probably looking at it going, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Oh, and now we've got even more. We can see how this fits inside here at the 95. That's two and a half percent on each side. Let me fit the tile in there. We're going to put our logo up here and our, our controls down here. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, we're nearly there. What we did find, though, is when we go from one level to another, it just sort of seemed a little bit quick. It's like, eh, we're pushing you through these things. We didn't get time to experience this nice, nice reward. So I want to experience this nice reward and have them show me these tiles. They, they're getting, or pods, they're, they're getting smaller and smaller. And so when I select all of these ones, I want a nice reward. I want to see the big pods there um, and then go to the next level. And that causes some problems because we have to adjust the wait times and all that. So anyway, let's come on down here. There they are working. And emitter. The other thing is, it, it could be a little bit better looking when we um, when we select rather than just getting oh, there. We should definitely have a sound. We're going to bring in some sounds in a moment, but we decided as well to add an emitter right here. 
So there's the rings container, and we've got this emitter preparing uh, right like that. And then down below, we're also going to activate the emitter. So this is us building the emitter just once, and it's up by the rings container. There it is, the rings container. And we put that in there. Uh, okay, duplicated and format the document. So in here, we're setting up our dashed and we're making an emitter and it's going to emit a new circle um, that is 90 in size in radius. It's clear and it's going to be a pink and purple. So as we emit this new circle, it's going to be pink and then purple. We might want to see what this emitter looks like without, we'll keep the start pause there. So here's the emitter uh, without our special stuff. And let's see what that looks like. Okay. Uh, we remove the style of dashed, although dashed won't do anything because we, oh, no, it won't do anything because we don't have a border on the defaults. And then we got to run the emitter. So let's bring in that code right here. Uh, where is this? This is beneath the existing next level call. So right there, copy beneath the existing next level call. Okay, where is the next level call? Make level pods dot on mouse down is probably in here. There it is. Next level call. And format. So uh, this is, oh, this isn't the right thing. Is it? Oh yeah, because that it's not always going to call the next level. This is where we're right. So good, we're correct. So we're in the, hey, you pressed on the right circle. And oh, I see, we've got the that in here as well. Correct.push, so we duplicated that. Yeah, so we're definitely in the right place, right here. These are the two things that we were adding beneath the next level. We're locating the emitter at the e dot target. So whatever we there's that e dot target again. We never did replace that with an easier command. We got e dot target through it there. Anyway, we're placing it at that and we're spurting. Um, one of the tricky bits is the next targets are going to be put on top of the emitter. So the emitter uh, will be on top and. We can't use top here. We could dot top, that, uh, not stop dot, did it again, dot top like that. Um, but the problem is when we locate an emitter, the particles are in a separate container from the emitter. So the emitter is one object and the particles are separate from it. And that's so that we can animate the emitter and move the emitter around and the particles don't all move with the emitter. It's really annoying to have that. Uh, that was the first, I don't know, three or four years of the emitter. And we realized that's not optimal. We don't want all the particles that have already been emitted to follow our emitter. It looks unnatural. Those emitters, those particles have been sent out into, into the air or into space or whatever. They're not supposed to be following our little, uh, you know, rocket or something that's shooting away. So um, we separated out those two things. And what that means is the particles will need to be brought to the top, not really the emitter. Okay, and so we have to do that in two steps. We're thinking a little bit about that. Could we always make the particles follow the one underneath the, the level of the emitter? And that's a tricky thing. We, we add objects to the stage in different ways. And every time we add an emitter, we'd have to, in each of those different ways, we'd have to put a, a, a conditional to see if this is an emitter. Uh, and, and we're not sure if it's worth it. So we're leaving it like this for now, but we are considering this, avoiding this tricky bit. All right, so there's the emitter located at the place. Oh, and we spurt. So that's only making two. Let's spurt a little bit more so we can experience the default, uh, the default emitter. And now we're going to experience the default emitter. So we refresh here. We need to get it right. Okay, that's the Zim, the Zim default emitter like that. All right, so we're instead going to emit some rings and we don't want 20 rings. We're only gonna spurt two rings. Well, it might be kind of fun to see 20 rings. Come up to the emitter here and let's see uh, what that looks like. So we're making them rings that are going to be pink and purple. 
and then we're also setting a, a longer interval. So rather than having them go like that, which is the default, by the way, here is something like 0 0.01 seconds. That would be every that would be 10 times a second. Uh, but anyway, we're we made it even more. So roughly three times a second or every 0.3 seconds. Also, we have no gravity. So instead of it falling down like like these ones, they fall down. If you take a look, see how they they shoot up. So we've got a force on them. So some of them shoot up, but then they fall down. Where's another one? OK, and you see how they're all falling down like that? That's gravity. So we took the gravity away. We took the force away. And instead, we're relying on this animation where we're going to just change the scale to 5. So every time we emit, we're going from a scale of 1 to a scale of 5. And we're pausing that at the beginning so it doesn't run all the time at the beginning. And here we go. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. Here we go. Wow, yeah. And another one. Hmm, there. All right, I don't know if you noticed though, but the white lines surrounding it are coming up right away and we'd rather them not come up right away. I'm trying, trying to find one here. There, ready? White lines right away. I want those to kind of come up later once we see the pink go out. I want the white lines to fade in. So we deal with that here. There's what it looks like. The white line shouldn't show up until the emitter is mostly finished. So we're going to animate in. We're going to start with the alpha. We're going to, these are the white line or the, the rings, the white lines, or the white, I guess it's a line in a circle. And we're going to set the alpha to zero and animate the alpha back up. So this is on the new circle which is down below here. There it is. So look at the loke. The lo we've got the loke on there, and there's the end of the statement. Don't do this. Because see, we've got the semicolon there, so we the dot is giving us an error. We don't want the semicolon. So remove that so we can continue to chain on the alpha, the animate, and we're waiting a little bit might even wait more and then setting the alpha not up to one but up to 0.9 so there we are animating this circle in and let's have a look better hey could almost wait a little bit longer let's try a 0.7 on that and see how that looks hmm Yeah, whatever, that's probably fine. So you get the initial effect. I just saw a duplicate again. There's something going on where we're getting a duplicate eternal. Did that go in the right place? Yeah, it seems all right. And here. Right, we have that issue in that we got this, uh, the rings going, and then, then the other ones come in. But anyway, we'll deal with that in a sec because we've got this reward screen coming up and it's going to affect our, our timer so now this is that reward that we were talking about where we want to show two uh, well the two two pods that we collected or if we're on the next level the three pods that we've collected and so we're adding in an extra weight on um the the pods thing there we're going to do this thing called a showcase. So we're adding a showcase, which is a tile, and then we're animating the showcase and clearing the interval. So all this goes right uh, above the clearing of the interval, and in between that and the last pods.cache. So we've got the last pods.cache. This is all up in, or down in here. Last pods.cache, and there's the interval.clear. So we're replacing that code and formatting the document. This is optional. Like I said, we're wanting to really make a complete game and make it feel like a you know, final game that we would want. So this tutorial has a bit more extra stuff built into it than just the game. We're basically done the game already, aren't we? Where, you know, we, we were 
already going up levels. We, the, the game was done a while back, but this is extra stuff now. So what are we going to do? We're going to wait before we animate the other ones out. Okay, we're showcasing, uh, with which is a new tile. We're tiling a clone of the pod. If we tiled the pod, it would pluck the pod from another location and do it. So we're cloning it first and tiling it. We set it up so that it has those dimensions. And then we're saying the count is whatever our stable count is. So you see what we've done? We've said the calls are two and the rows are three. That will handle six at, at most, but only do this count of them. So even though we've got that many calls and that many rows, please only give me two things. And then the first time it runs, it'll go in those two. Next time it runs three, three times, it will go in this one and one in the, in the row. So it'll go the first two columns, one in the row. And when it gets up to six, finally, it will go two, two, and two. So three, three rows. And so that's how we're handling that. We center that on the stage. We're looping through and we are setting the pods. I wonder if this works. We had a problem with once we cloned, once we cloned the pod, we had a problem making the frame number work. So normally we would have done this pod.frame is equal to, I just want to, check this out, Eternals 1 and 2 here, and see if we fixed that bug or figured out why it was doing it. Okay, so there we go. This would have been the easy way where we're setting the frame numbers to whatever the Eternals number is. And if I save that and refresh over here, we need to win. So there's one. Oh, look at that effect. Wow. And when we get sound in, it will be even better. Where's the other one? There it is. Two. Oh, darn. So we haven't finished the timings. We, we brought this one in too quickly. This is the next pod, and it came in too quickly. So let's uh, just fix that. So now we need to adjust the pod animate wait time. So right here, 3.5. And this is up in that where we had the wait we want 3.5. I think it was only waiting one second or something. So we have to fix that before we can check this out. So if we come on up, rings top, where was that weight? Not there. That's a different weight. <laughs> I can't remember. That's the emitter. We're out. Pods.tile. Okay, let's do a search for weight. There's a weight of 0.7. There it is. Okay. So pods.alpha, we're animating that in. We're only waiting one. We want to wait 3.5 so that that uh, the showcase has time to show up. So that's what we were doing there. And we refresh this. Let's try it again. We got a win again. Hmm. There. Okay, that's one. And there, two. Ah, see, it didn't go to the frames. The, it tried to go to the frames, but didn't seem to go to the frames. So instead of doing it this way, we found that and that's kind of like a strange case. If we, if we make the tile out of just the pods, it worked. Oh! No, I was going to say, oh, wait a minute, this is a clone and that's a pod and we've got the wrong pod. But no, this is the pod right here where we're looping through that. So it's so weird if we make the tile with a, a cloned pod, the frames don't seem to kick in. If we make the tile with the pod, the frames work. <laughs> so we need to go in and find out what the heck is causing that. Uh, but at the moment, so sorry about that, we're going to run instead. We're going to run the pod. And we're going to start it off at whatever frame we want. And the end frame is going to be whatever frame we want. And then this works. <laughs> so our apologies. And here we go. There. Oh, it's that's a wrong one. You still have to figure out what to do when it's wrong. That'll be with respect to the timer. This one is right. And there it is. Two right ones. And there they are. Is that actually the one? <laughs> I don't know. Let me refresh that again. Was it that blue one that I selected? 
So let's pay attention to the ones we select this time. Okay, it's sort of a pinky one going off to the one side and a purpley one. It's not, they're the wrong ones. Um, I wonder if it has something to do with those eternal indexes that we put in there. Remember that we had, yeah, I expect so. So eternals at I, and this is, yeah, the index, eternals at I. Anyway, we'll have to look at that. Maybe what we can do is just back out of our correction of the eternals, way up at the top here. Where was that? Um, it was in our preparation. Next level showcase, showcase next level. Down in here, shuffle, splice, eternals, spots was, it was like something like that, but it was eternals. Spots.index of. Where do we where do we do the eternals? Control F Eternals. Eternals is there, eternals is here, and press down, show the eternal how many eternals do we have? Two of nine. I'm back up, I'm in my loop. So that's weird. Did we replace that code? I thought we, it was this one. Overrate with the eternals frame. It wasn't spots at index. It was eternals at index. Eternals at index. So if we do that and refresh here, does it work? One. Two. Us. Yeah, all right, that works. Okay, well, okay, let's take a closer look and make sure once more. It's the green one that looks like orbits and it's the blue one that looks like a doily. Doily in orbits. All right, we're back in action. Bum, bum, bum. So uh, maybe what we should do is edit this. Mm, you guys are, you guys are gonna kill me. <laughs> coming back here and editing fixing that right there pods dot frame overwrite with the eternal not spots but eternals oh it caused a, a wrap on that overwrite with overwrite mm. <laughs> so by, not very much just don't want it wrapping overwrite with uh, eternal Okay, good enough. <laughs> Yay! And there it's not uh, causing a scroll. That should be. All right, good. Hopefully we didn't repeat that code somewhere else. I don't think so, but I can do a double check on that later. It's just hard to remember some of these little things, you know, as we're, as we're doing it. I don't think it's in there. All right, probably good. Looks, looks good. Okay, back to it then. What do we do next? Final touches! Woohoo! We're on final touches, ladies and gentlemen, although there's still a lot. So what I want you to do is just um, take a relax, maybe play the game a little bit <laughs> and get better at it. Take a cookie, take a little break, but make sure you come back because these final touches include the leaderboard, they include sound, and uh, also the controls down here at the bottom. So there's still a fair bit to do, yeah. And this is, we're, we're at two hours already, um, but uh, come back and finish this off. You can do it. You can be model students. That would be good. So what have we got next? We should always try and code the actual game first to make sure you can do it and that you like it. And then add things like sounds and final scores and interfaces and things. And even images. Sometimes we leave those to the end, but it was nice to work with our sprite. So we're going to go grab some more assets. And this one looks a little bit odd because we're using an audio sprite in this case. Uh, but let's copy this in. This goes right to the function ready. And up above, so we'll copy that. 
and put it in, see what we've got going on. Right up at the top. <clears throat> So right now we have just the plasma pods and that's the path and we pass that in after the ready and there's the ready and we're going to replace that with all this stuff uh, format document so now our assets are the font gf honk that stands for google fonts it's our a zim shortcut that goes right to the google fonts so that's nice there's our plasma pods we have an intro mp3 and then we've got this audio sprite data which comes from up here so we we recorded this in premiere uh, I don't know, can't remember anyway we recorded it in adobe premiere or what we did is we threw all the songs in there and then we recorded where the beginning of the song is and where the end of it is or sounds i guess and we did this a long time ago way back in the flash days even uh, we had these sounds oh no actually the audio sprite was recent like uh well not recent but 10 years ago in in zim whenever we launched the audio sprite but the sounds themselves came from flash games that we made and they came from the internet i have no idea who made them or where they are from so thank you for these very 8-bit sounds that we're bringing in here so we decided to use some of those sounds in this game and hence the audio sprite okay um, there are tools you can look up in zim in the docs under audio sprite there's tools that will make this kind of stuff for you but we made our own in that case and we're bringing in audio sprite there's a couple different formats of them create just as a format I can't remember there's a common uh, a common tool that is used and it's got a format and anyway there's we support those so we're also once we bring in some sounds like that that's a bunch of sounds although it's in one sound file that's the neat thing about it it's in one sound file which means mobile handles it a bit loading it a bit better and it, it then jumps to the sound at that at that uh, time it's kind of cool but we are loading in sounds they're bigger than images sometimes so we're going to create a waiter as well and pass that in as a progress right there or you could do a progress bar progress bar like that and progress bars have different formats as well but the waiter are three little dot dots this one's not so much that uh, three little dot dots are fine so there's our frame we pass in the assets the path and the progress bar if you were using load assets, it's the same thing. And it's assets, path, and progress bar, and load assets as well. Great. <clears throat> okay, what's next? So if you're in the editor, there you go. Logo. We're going to put in the logo at the top now that we have the Google fonts. Here's the logo right here. So I'm copying this code and putting it, I think it was right up at the top here. Here it is. It's going to say we're using a label and it will say eternal orbs. That's the font size. Here is the font. Note that we don't use the GF, just use the font name. And we're positioning this zero from the center and 50 from, by default, the top, like that. But we don't have to put it if that's a default on the stage. And we refresh here. Ooh, eternal orbs. Wow, nice. Sorry, bring that back. Okay, controls. So we're going to add some interface down at the bottom, a mute button and a timer and how many eternals we're trying to capture. We're gonna use a tile to space those. And we'll, we'll put, even though this is at the bottom, we're gonna put this code up at the top just to keep it in view sort of thing so copying this code and sticking it underneath the label here could probably go down at the bottom too but no format document still all right so what are we doing we're making a mute button so there's a button there's our make icon and if you want to know what other icons there are you can make icons so oh no sorry uh list icons lost icons <laughs> so there's list icons and when you run it here 
and refresh, there's a bunch of the icons that we have. There's also shapes, and so make shapes, list shapes, and there's patterns that you can do. There's the mute. We've got a close. <laughs> That's just an X. Fast forward, rewinds, plays, different types of arrows, hearts, markers, edits, magnifying glasses, that kind of stuff. If there's any icons that you think should be in there, let us know. And we'd be happy to add them. Oh, that put the stuff down there at the bottom. I forgot that it was going to do that. Okay, find two. And there's the timers going. And here's the, the, the mute. And we'll see how that, you see the little X on there. That's basically one is sound and one's mute. The, the icon type. So we're toggling icons. And if we take a look at the button, we've got a backing of the sound icon that's orange and we scaled it up a bit and then we've got a toggle backing of the make icon mute and this toggle backing means that whenever we press on the button it's going to toggle to that icon we've also got uh, labels and or what is it text no, label label and toggle toggle is how it does a toggle label and there's also a backing toggle backing and the difference is the icon is the thing that would show up on a backing. So a button has a backing. It's got a background color, but backing, it's got an icon, and it's got a label. Usually we just use a label and not the icon or the backing, but in this case, it's an icon. <clears throat> we don't need to list anymore. What else have we got? We've got another label, find, and right now it's hard-coded to two, so we'll have to deal with how do we handle that for each label. So we've got a mute button, a find label, and here's a timer. This comes from the game module. Oh, the make icon comes from the pizzazz module. So up above here, make icons coming from pizzazz. And the timer is coming from the game module. There's its background color, and down is false. Usually a timer counts down from 60, so if you took these two things away here, it would be counting down from 60. Uh, if you say the time, 40, it would be counting down from 40, but now that we've said down false, it will be counting up from zero. And so that's what we saw. It's been almost just over two minutes since we last <laughs> loaded this. Okay. And what do we, oh, uh, last step is we're tiling it. So now we make a tile of those three items, three columns, one row, that's the horizontal spacing, vertical spacing, not that it matters. This last one does matter. That means unique. Treat, treat our, uh, that thing as unique. It will uniquely place mute, find, and timer. Otherwise it would randomly pick from those and that would look really awkward. So you want to see the random picking. Ah. Oh. Oh. Ah. Well, actually, that one's close. <laughs> okay. So there it is, randomly picking from those objects in Thailand, <laughs> which is what we don't want. So uh, that means true. Okay. Uh, and we position that at 0, 40, center from the bottom that time, and that's why it's going at the bottom. Isn't pose nice? That makes it really easy. It's very much like the positioning left, top, center, right in HTML. Uh, but we also have, oh, not center, sorry, left, right, top, bottom. No centers in HTML. It would be really nice if there were one, uh, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, um, and we've got a center in Zim. Good. What's next then? Isn't that amazing? So we got that uh, going already. Sim's got lots of interfaces, which are um, components, which makes for good interfaces. We need to update the number of eternals. Right. So wherever it says handle le le levels, han handle levels, we got to go find that. There's levels, but we want handle levels. Handle levels. And we'll tuck that in there. So the find text, we're going to change every level we go to find plus whatever the stable number is. And we'll quickly check that, shall we? Yeah, there we go. We have to find two. There's one. And we're finding two right down there now. And one more. That one. Okay, now it says 
find three. So, uh, yeah. It might have left that around for a little bit longer. It says find three before we have the opportunity to find three. Like maybe you went, as this fades in, find three goes there, but uh, whatever. Sound. Up top, below the logo, let's prepare all of our sounds. So just below the logo, we're going to stick in some sounds here. Okay. Ah, back up, back up we go. Note that in VS Code you can pull this scroller, but this scroller takes longer to get to than this scroller right here. So this is the little mini map of it if you've got that. And there's less scrolling needed than this one. So sometimes it's better to just poke on the mini map. You don't even need to scroll then. You can just like jump around in there. So we're back up at the top uh, below the logo. Too much up at the top below the logo where is the logo these days there it is and there's our sounds um to bring in a sound we've we've already preloaded the sound right there intro and to use it then we use a new odd for audio there's the sound Point one is the volume, and true means to loop. So this is the intro sound, which is not really the intro sound. That's a backing sound, really. Yeah. It just happened to be called <laughs> intro.mp3. Maybe that's why we call it. But anyway, this is our backing sound. We're going to loop that. The other sounds right here are coming from the IDs of the audio sprite right there. We've left those IDs the same throughout all of the things we've built with these sounds, just so you know, we don't have a black ball here, but that, that's a sound originally. This was made for Gobstop. Gobstop had a black ball in it, and whenever the black ball comes up, it came up, it would go like that, <laughs> and bounces. We're not using a bounce here either. So there's a few sounds in here we're not using, but we're using four of them, and we just left it in audio spray. Probably be, yeah, and it's hard to tell. Uh, what would be more efficient, probably be more efficient to load them in individually. But there we go. There's your volumes uh, of those as well. We've stored them in variables. And uh, rather than every time we say get something right, we're not making a new audio object each time we get something right. All we're going to do is go write sound dot play like that. And that will play the sound that we made here. And you can play any number of sounds, uh, or you can play the same. You can play any number of sounds if you want to load the sounds, but you can play the same sound any number of times. I'm trying to say with the play button, and that causes a bit of a problem because what if you wanted to play the sound but then turn off the volume or reduce the, or fade out the volume of another of the previous sound that was playing the same thing? So in other words. Uh, I go and I play this one, and then the next, uh, and then I want to fade it out later. How do you know which instance it is that you're working with? Well, the answer is you store it in a variable, so const one is equal to this. So now one is the results of this play, and that's called a create.js sound instance, abstract sound instance, actually. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, just treat it as the ID of that specific sound. And now I can play it again and call that two. Uh, and anytime I want to control one, I now have access to it. So that's what we're doing with intro here. We are going to eventually play the intro, but then we're going to be able to mute or like fade out the intro and fade in the intro. And to do that, anytime you want to fade something after a sound is made, you have to store the play, the results of the play in a variable and then use that variable. Okay, so that's the deal. Um, by the way, you might have been wondering, well, can I stop it from playing two sounds at the same time, the same song, same sounds at the same time? And yes, you can. That's called interrupt. So you can say how many times a specific sound, like if I'm firing, doo, 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 Sometimes they're a bit longer, so it's going like that kind of thing. Sometimes you don't want that to happen or having multiple sounds play on top of one another. 
So Zim's got, uh, based on the CreateJS, Zim's got these things called interrupts and uh, num sounds or some max num, I think it is max num. So in the frame, you can set a max num for a sound. And then when you load them, uh, it will only ever play up to two of them or three of them or only one of them. And if it does play one of them, what happens when a new sound with the same type of sound plays? Does it interrupt it? And so that's the interrupt. Does it override it so that the old one goes away and the new one starts from the beginning? Or does it ignore it? Is interrupt false? And that way the, um, the old sound continues to play as you're trying to play a new sound, it won't play. So all that stuff's available as well. Uh, by the way, this is called interactive media, what we're making here. Uh, it used to be called interactive multimedia. And it's been around since the 90s, I guess, primarily with things like Director initially and then Flash. And all those had interrupts as well. This We know about this stuff because we make these things. We've been making them for 30 years. And this is more of all that. This is a very logical people understanding what happens. And all of that stuff is built into Zim. Zim is like third generation of all of that stuff. We know all that stuff and it's all in here. So that's exciting. All right. Um, let's play some sounds then. Bum, bum, bum. So we're going to sprinkle the sounds through the code. Do you like that? I'm like such an author. <laughs> This isn't Medium. Medium is a place where people publish articles. So uh, anyway, if you like that, that sounds good. Sprinkle the sounds throughout the code. And we're going to do the intro when we bring in the leaderboard. Uh, by the way, you're not allowed to play a sound on the canvas. You're not allowed to play a sound um, until somebody interacts with the, like, presses on something. So we show the leaderboard to start with a play button. When we press that, then we play the intro sound. We don't try and play the intro sound right away. You'd get an error. All right, so here is where we are doing a weighted. Remember that 3.5? This is every time we run a level. So if we don't weight anything, it's gonna, weighted will be zero, and, but that's okay. The weighted call will still run. And this is what we're saying right here. So we're gonna put that in, in a weighted call. Let's put it in, we'll talk more about it. That's in the pods.animate 3.5, control F, 3.5. There we go. And now once we've weighted, we're showing, we're going to be animating in the new pods. Then we're wanting to play the start sound, but we don't wanna play that start sound if Mute is not toggled. Uh, okay. So mute.toggled would be on mute. And if we're not on mute, then we play the sound. Okay, sorry for the double negative, but that's how it goes sometimes. All right, so there we are going to play a start sound. Do you want to hear it? Here we go. I hope you can see hear these things. I think you can in the recording. I didn't hear it. <laughs> oh, this because we we didn't interact with it. I don't know why. Well, we let's win and go to the next level, and then we'll see what happens there. I still didn't hear it. Oh, there it is. I heard it. Yeah, I heard it. Right. We had. Uh, right. Did you hear it? We had to go to the um, showcase first. All right. Good. We got one. Let's get another of our sprinklings. If we're correct, then we're going to play the correct sound. If we're wrong, we're gonna play the wrong sound. So let's go into correct. Next level, showcase. Where do we find out if we're correct or not? Control F, correct. And all right, correct a few times. Here it is. So this is when in, in, the, in our mouse down, when we press on our mouse down, we're correct. If we're correct, we're going to play the right sound, but only if <laughs> we're not on mute. And then if we're wrong, right here, here's wrong, we're going to play the wrong sound. Good. We'll get to hear these even sooner here. We refresh. And wrong. Wrong. 
correct. Oh, nice. That goes nicely with our little rings that fly open there. You should always try uh, to find a sound that... That's in the wrong place, that very first one. I tried that a couple times, and it seems to be uh, shooting out at the wrong place. That's right. That's wrong, but we don't have a right one. We'll have to check out that bug. It looks like the very first one starts from up in the left-hand corner for some reason. It's not like a center regged. Might mean that that one didn't get center regged for some reason. Uh, okay, so anyway, it's always nice to have a sound that goes for roughly the same length as your animation or vice versa. So usually uh, you have to match the sound. So if my sound was just boing like that, it wouldn't really make sense to have the, the emitter be take so long. We might want a faster emitter maybe. But this one is a, it's an emitter that sort of shoots out and our sound matches that. Let's do it again if we can find out which one's not going there. Okay, it matches that, that's nice. There's the wrong. Oh, we're at the leaderboard. Hey, we're almost there. We're almost there. Woohoo. So at the leaderboard right here, this is by the bottom, which we're removing to a start game and a sprite. So all the way to the sprite. Copy that. From the tile to the sprite. From the tile to the sprite. It's up here somewhere. From the tile to the sprite. Here's the tile. There's the sprite. Okay. Do we have to get the sprite? Yeah, we get the sprite. Okay. Probably doesn't matter, but we will format the document. And let's have a look. So we're trying to start the game, which means we're going to be broken because we've actually got a start game function that we haven't ended. Uh, but let's see what we're adding. In the tile. So that's the bottom stuff. We removed it. So we made it, positioned it, and then removed it. And we're going to add it again later, which means we could have possibly um, added all this stuff in the leaderboard event. But whatever, we can buy it. We just removed it, and then we'll add it later. So here's the leaderboard, a new leaderboard. To get the leaderboard to work, we would have to import the game module, zim underscore game. We got a bit of data there, and that data is actually here. So in the leaderboard, you can get your own leaderboard if you go to that and fill in this information here. Okay. And then we will send you a leaderboard code, your very own leaderboard code, which looks like that for me or for this game. Right? Or you can use your own database. So the leaderboard set up so that you can use your own database and you can figure out how to do all that. Or you can just piggyback on the Zim servers and use the Zim database. Uh, we're formatting that a little bit in reverse because times the high, the lower your time, the higher you are on the leaderboard. That's a little bit unusual. So we're reverse there. We're positioning that on the stage and leaderboard.onclose, we're calling start game. So uh, that's when the leaderboard gets closed, it can start game. But we also have, so the leaderboard, I think, has an X on the top of it to close it. I, mean, I can't remember there. Or maybe once you press on it, it closes. But um, we also have a play button. And when we tap on the play button right here, so here's a play button. When we tap on it, we're also going to leaderboard remove and start the game. So that this play button is kind of separate from the leaderboard and that's how both of those things work. And here's start game. So we've made a function. We've, we're adding, once we start the game, we add the, the controls back to the bottom. We set the timer to zero. That might be unnecessary. Oh no, it might not be unnecessary because if we made it initially, the timer is going, but we're gonna restart it at zero. Great. And we're gonna play a sound. So here's us playing the intro sound if we don't already have the sound. And if it's not, this won't ever happen because we can't even see the leaderboard. Maybe we start the, yeah, okay, it will happen because when we restart the game, I think we just show the leaderboard again and all this stuff comes back and then we're restarting the game. So anyway, dealing with that so that we don't make the sound twice and we're playing the start, start sound again at the very beginning if we 
You know what that means to me? That means to me that perhaps the weighted event doesn't happen because uh, wherever we had that weighted call right here, I don't think I was hearing it the very first time when we ran it now. So maybe if it's zero, it doesn't wait and that never gets called. It looks like we're calling it. Also note that we've got, I, I think we're almost done up there. Let's just check on that. Start game, play dot remove from, remove the play button, and then we're into, yeah, so we're done. So that's the beginning of our start game function. I was just noticing a red mark down here. So at the bottom here, uh, we need the end of it and uh, probably format document. Oop, yeah. So this is the end of start game right there. And it probably says that back in our tutorial. So there's there's the start game stuff. And now we have to, there's the make level, make level, uh, end of start game, make, uh, all right, because we put the make level down at the bottom. Make level, okay, end of start game. So now we have no red thing and we should be able to test our app. Ah, now it starts with the leaderboard. How cool is that? Right. So poor Carl. <laughs> Carl some somehow hacked into the like red red something somewhere. Saw <laughs> yeah, I think they read a draft video up from the forum, and uh, hacked in here and come into play. Anyway, we play. Ah, right. We got that sound at the beginning. There's our background sound is playing. Does the mute work? No. Okay, so we still have to connect up the mute. There's our sound. Oh, I'm, I was going, why didn't we hear her? So I don't hear my sounds. Isn't that cool? Did you, did you catch that? However, we didn't mute the main sound. So if I bring this back and I get one wrong, there's the wrong sound. Good. And do we have a right sound? All right, nice. Okay, there's our two. And here in comes the, the new one. All right, we're looking good. Let's, oh, I can't, I was going to say, let's mute that, but I can't mute it. That means it's going to be, keep on playing unless I close that. All right. So we're nearly there, folks. Uh, the mute button, let's fix that up. So here's the mute button. It gets this little bit of extra code and that will handle the mute button. And then we have the wrong thing and that's, that's it, the conclusion. So we just have to do what's wrong rather than, or what, what do we do when we're wrong? Almost there. So this was on the mute button, which is up in our bottom interface right here, the mute button. Watch the semicolon there. Paste. And format. Or we could drop this down if we wanted to. Oops. There we go. So expand. What expand does is it will turn that into a little box. Uh, it makes the click area the bounding box it's called around it because the icon has I don't know if you noticed that but back here oh I closed it darn uh, did I save it I can't remember what happens if I open a default browser without saving I think yeah the mute still doesn't work so that's fine so you see what happens is I can't click around the edge of the icon here I have to be right on the icon before I can click so expand will make it so that this whole box around it um, is clickable. And then it adds even 20 more pixels by default. But you expand zero would be just the box. Expand 20 is default. Expand 50 would make it even bigger. And what that just means is we can now mute this in a, a larger area. It's better on mobile so that you don't have to, it's practically made for mobile. So that's what the expand does. Uh, the tap, and as a matter of fact, let's just save it and see that expand. Refresh here. Play. Okay, so now my finger is bigger on this thing. Okay, and there it is off. Yeah. Okay, and I can get it that better. Oh, and my mute's working. Oh, nice. Oh, is that peaceful? So here's what we're doing when we expand. We've also added a tap on the end of that. If the mute 
toggle and there's an intro then intro dot fade out so we've added in a recent version of zim a fade method to a sound so that fades it out and then the other if we're going to fade it back in i'm not sure there was ever a time when the intro oh that's because yeah we want to make sure the intro exists rather than just using else and there we are fading back in great all right all right coming close end game just when you thought we would never get there <laughs> i'm kind of thinking that you think of that we're two and a half hours ah um we're gonna add to the timer okay so if we get a wrong guess rather than just make it smaller we're not even going to make the orb smaller because that that actually makes it easier because then anything we've already guessed goes smaller i'd rather it be uh, you have to remember which ones you've guessed but anyway um we're going to play the wrong sound and we're going to increase time on the timer so that will add 10 on the timer let's go in and put that in so when we got something wrong wrong we are going to increase the timer. Did we play the wrong sound? Yeah, there's the, the wrong sound. Timer dot time plus equals 10. And that will add to the timer. So we use the time property of the timer. If we had a scorer, then we would use the score property of the scorer. So Zim's got a scorer and a timer. And then our last thing, when the game's done. This is when the game's done. We are going to do this stuff. And we'll put that in and have a look. Oh, that's our that's for testing it. Okay, so we can test when the game's done easy more easily. And where do we find out if the game is done? Uh, where is that again? Hmm. Handle levels. Next level. level game done right there okay and we will format the document on that game done so there's the end game we clear the interval so stop that interval from happening um, because we're not going to call another level so the interval clearing was when we called a new level we cleared the interval but when the game's done we don't call a new level so we have to clear the interval we have to animate the rings out so they disappear we set the leaderboard score so this will um set add our timer dot time to the leaderboard if it's not in the top 10 or however many leaders you have you can specify that if it's not in that then it won't bother bother putting it in there but otherwise it'll uh, let you add something and then in a timeout so after we've shown the last showcase we're going to remove the bottom functionality the controls Re remove the rings we actually don't need to remove the rings because we're going to dispose them so that was uh, in here level complete we are, I guess we weren't there yet. Final touches, boop, 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 sorry. Nearly there, leaderboard. Wow, what a tutorial this has been, huh? And we don't need to remove all the children at that point. Okay, good. There. So, We'll just dispose the rings. No point in removing all the children if we're going to dispose it. And the leaderboard dot add to. So that adds the leaderboard back to the stage at whatever X and Y it was before, which was centered and placed. Okay, and we play, uh, we set the play button. We add the play button back to where it was. And then we hit the end sound play as well. So we're showing the leaderboard after we add the score to it now we want to test this but the thing is we don't want to uh, wait for to go through all our levels so we'll come up and find our levels they're up here somewhere there they are as a matter of fact let's just test after one level is that okay <laughs> here it, it's suggesting we can bring these back and test after two levels but in uh, for time's sake let's uh, just test after one level we refresh here 
There's the leaderboard. Oh, there was us closing the leaderboard without using the play button. So yeah, that was needed. And now there's an eternal. With one more eternal, we should see the leaderboard again. Mm, there. There's the weight. And leaderboard. Oh, and look at that. We, that's the end sound. Wasn't that a great sound? And look at where we are. Number one at 13 seconds. Nobody's ever going to beat that. Wow. And so here we can type in things. We can also hit uh, letters on my keyboard, A, G, and we can also pull and scroll up and down like that with your finger if you're on mobile and uh, go through that A, A, G. If we hit save, we'd be at the top of the leaderboard. Uh, we don't want that. Leaderboard, by the way, probably has a method to clear it. If you ever are practicing things and want to clear it, uh, take a look at the docs under leaderboard and you would see something like that. Anyway, we won't bother saving it, but we'll play again. And here we are playing again. And that's great. Can we mute and we mute? We're all good. Wow. 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 Are you happy? Yay. Uh, let's just um, put that back again, though. So we didn't do that. Uh, there we go. We're back to uh, We'd have to go through all those levels to be able to do that. You should try that and see if um, see if you can beat our score. That sound good? Conclusion. So we did take time to make a complete tile or pattern game, including logo with custom font, leaderboard, sound with audio sprite. You don't always need to use an audio sprite. Usually most of the things we make don't have an audio sprite, just sound. Um, mute buttons, levels, emitter rewards, Sprites, this is Texture Atlas. You don't have to use a Sprite, but you can. All right, and uh, let's see. Have a look through the Zim game banners. So this is suggesting what to do next on your conclusion. So this goes to the banners at Zim, or if you're on the Zim site, scroll down to the banners here, and there's the banner on games. And you can see some other games. We feature that because that's a tile game. This was Odd Robots. We love Odd Robots. <laughs> You're trying to find a robot that is evil. Okay, and then it goes to the next level. Yes. Mm. Yes. All right. Okay, so that's a tile game called Odd Robots. Here is Dodo Dots. It's also a tile game. So you can see the games there, but also the more section here, which takes you through what we make games with hit tests. We didn't look at this time. We looked a little bit at sprites. There's some information on a texture atlas, for instance, physics, modules, uh, the game module there with the leaderboard, organization, industry, etc. So you can expand open the more section of any of those. Okay, any of those banners. And back here. Uh, here's another tile game that is the flipping tile game. So that was in our e-learning apps where you caught the concentration type game where you try and do matches. That's pretty complicated to make, but we got that there. And this could be called a tile game. That's where a scrambler, and that's really easy. New pick dot scramble basically, or you chop it up and then you scramble it and you've got a scrambler. That's like a puzzle. Here uh, we will be posting all of our other um, tutorials that get published, so that's there for now. And also check the Zim examples for a bunch of games in the examples. Come and join us on the forum or on Discord. I'm Dr. Abstract. And what have we been doing? Oh, oh mm, I think this has been a make HTML5 games, all you need to make a tile game. Was that good? Even if you started from scratch and didn't know how to code? Uh, I think some of our explanations probably went a bit quickly if that were the case, but at least you've got the code here. You can put it in and play with it. Uh, also in the editor as well. That's a wonderful place to learn. And uh, check out the zaps in the editor. It's a little button at the bottom left and you can find all sorts of examples of building things with Zim. I am Dr. Abstract. Have a great day or night. Cheers. And if you're on YouTube, which you probably are, give this thing a little thumbs up. Yeah. Come join us in the forum. Ciao.